And welcome to It's All Good All on Rebellious Equality. <laughs> I am Lynn Hurley now. Yes. And I have with me. What? Yes, I Did told you. you. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. I, I didn't know. I didn't know it was recent. You probably didn't see it. Well, with all of the, the issues with like with the kitty dying, you know. Yeah. There was a well, lot. congratulations. And I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, we have an interesting guest. We share, you know, we share the same neighborhoods. Yes. He lived in Hawaii for a long time, and I lived there also. So it's going to be it's going to be fun. It's going it to be is. Fun. It is. So for everyone that doesn't know, every Monday at eight p.m. Eastern, Jim and I get together to discuss well, kind of whatever is on our minds that week, and we might even throw in a few guests here and there, which we do have tonight. I'm so excited. Uh, you can find our show on YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, and now on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Anchor FM, and Spotify. And if you guys like the show, please go ahead and join the rebellion by subscribing. Don't forget to ring the bell so you'll get all the notifications. And you can also hit that like button and share the love, share the show with everyone so they can join us tonight. It's going to be a great conversation. Because yes, tonight, it is. yes, Jim and I will be sitting down to talk with Tim Senor. Tim was one of several witnesses at an event that took place on July 5th in 2019 at Bainbridge Island, Washington. You might have heard of it. He was accompanied by his father, Donald Senor, along with other family members to witness an event that defies the norm from Tic Tac UFOs and much more. Tim has degrees in psychology, broadcast programming, and media production, which clearly means he's perfect for ufology. I mean, psychology, programming, media... Uh, he's also a writer with the pen name of David Powers and a father of five, which I don't know how he gets any sleep at all. Just the five alone. I don't think I could sleep. But just a reminder, everyone, before we start, if you have a question in the chat, please type it in all caps so that we can see it easier. And if you know someone who might enjoy the conversation, like I said, please feel free to share the love, share the show so that they can join us. All right, Jim, what do you say we get Tim in here with us? Let's get it going. This sounds like a good idea to me. All right. Put Tim, my eyes on welcome. So Ta-da. <laughs> hey. How's it going, guys? Thank you good. so much for inviting me. Oh, we're so happy to have you. Yeah. And I must say, Jim, thank you for your service. And it's an absolute honor to meet you, sir. Well, I'm, deli I'm, de I'm delighted to meet you as well. And... I spent 27 years of, of my life with the little thing said, you know, I would uh, go wherever the uh, military wanted me to go. So I'm, I'm proud to be a veteran and I'm, and I'm, I'm proud to be a, a retired master sergeant. So it was, Thank uh, you for your service. it was something I, something I really didn't have a choice. I, when I was, uh, I was a juvenile delinquent. I know you probably, 
would find that hard to believe, but I was a juvenile, juvenile delinquent. And I had a, uh, on my 17th birthday, I had an option, either shape up and fly right, which wasn't going to happen, uh, go to detention for a year until my 18th birthday as an incorrigible youth, or join the military. Well, I aced all the, <laughs> I aced all the entrance examinations so I can go in the, I, you know, it gave me an opportunity to go in the Air Force. And that's what I did. And, and on my 17th birthday, I put my hand up and I said, I swear, hereby swear to uh, uphold the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And uh, I'm I'm glad I did. It probably kept me out of the morgue or out of yeah. the uh, uh, rehab house. Uh, so maybe I, too. I, I, I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in, in the Mountain View, Los Altos area of Silicon Valley. Very when familiar was, with that area. When it I was, actually lived in Brentwood up there. So. Okay. Okay. Well, I lived. Yeah, I lived right on the border of Los Altos and Mountain View, and uh, yeah. so many of my friends never made it. You know, into their into their mid twenties. You know, they were either incarcerated or they died of drug overdoses. So the Air Force, yeah. uh, the Air Force did a number on me. It, it made me grow up. It made me accept responsibility because. Uh, they could do that. <laughs> yeah. This 1960, 1962. So, um, and it was the best thing ever happened to me. I got exposed to people I never thought I'd uh, be exposed to. I saw things that I never thought I would ever dream of. I joined the, I joined the Air Force because I love airplanes. And yeah. like I was saying earlier, uh, before the show started, I saw my first Blackbird on March 10th, 1964. I was an 18 year old airman, second class TDY at Edwards Air Force Base, and I've never been the same. And if it hadn't been for that, I, I wouldn't end up, you know, you know in your uh, lead in. You know, Lynn said you're a published author, as am I. And I, you know, I wasn't on Bainbridge Island, but I, you know, but I lived on Whidbey Island, just you know, just up the Sound for uh, eight years, yeah. nine years. My ex lives there now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful part of the world though it oh really yeah is. oh yeah but yeah. uh but the yeah the ferry rates i i worked at Payne field i was a restoration oh, yeah. manager for the museum of flight mm -hmm. and the ferry i mean you could walk on the ferry for free uh motorcycles were like a buck 75 or two and a quarter now it's almost 20 bucks round trip. Maybe it's more than 20 bucks. It's the last time I went on the ferry to Whidbey. It's about that. And that was the senior discount. It was $8.75. And right. uh, 18, not $8.75. I don't know how people do it if we live in the island. Yeah. But it, it was we a wonderful, it was a wonderful it. time. I, I love the Pacific Northwest. It's gotten yeah. too crazy. Uh, I left there, went to Hawaii for four years. That's why I said I lived the Ilikai. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, when, I retired, that when I retired, when I retired, there wasn't Hawaii is, was just too small, too expensive, but I didn't want, I, I spent a lot of my years in Minnesota. I never wanted to shovel snow again. So <laughs> I, I live in the desert. I live just outside of Tucson and it was already 109 mm. this week. And, Wow. It may, it may hit 110 or 111 early next week. Well, I finally got my first taste of the true desert when I visited the Uinta Basin uh, with Lou and her new husband, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And so I understand having a real deep passion for that uh, part of the world or the, the desert just in general. Um, there's it. definitely something very um, energetic about it. Um, it's kind of hard to put your you know, word, you know, put it into words, but um, yeah, I definitely get that. But definitely appreciate your history and your large body of work. Um, a lot of what I read is written by Jim Goodall. I think some of my favorite books, um, you know, so, oh, and I actually at some point have a couple of questions. Obviously, I, I understand <laughs> this is your show, but I, I sure do have a, at least one question for you, Jim, at some point. Well, yeah. Why don't you ask it now? I mean, <laughs> well, it concerns the TR3B and your position on its existence. And the reason I'm specifically bringing it up is because potentially one of our good friends here, Lynn, uh, Mr. Terry Hall, potentially 
has a brand new video of that shot as oh. says a few days ago. Wow. So we're we're looking into its um, what it actually is um, and to to verify it. But we're pretty sure from a great source that we may have ha had some eyes on this. Um, do you feel like it's ours or theirs? And well, what's your experience with this TR3B? I know you've done a film on it. Now that I was uh, I was in with Do Darcy artist. Weir on his film. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now there's there's two categories of TR you know TR3Bs. Any of them, any craft, regardless of what the shape is, if it has cl anti-collision lights, a red and green light, more than likely that is made by man. Hmm. But there's been some, uh, you know, TR3B shots that, you know, there's all you have is the, you know, is the three pointed lights, you know, the white yeah. ones on the bottom and, and the center. Uh, and it's, it, I have to I have to believe that it's been you know the TR3Bs that humans are flying and created were probably done with reverse engineering mm -hmm. of the actual craft and maybe with help. I mean I, I have a I have a friend of mine who uh, I don't know if he still works for the NSA but was a, you know, was an analyst with with the National Security Agency. And when Tucker Carlson and the, the government person came out, it was it last year or two years ago, uh, there are craft over, you know, flying over our mil military installations that are not of this earth. So hmm. I, sent, I sent her an email. I said, hey, do you believe in UFOs? And I got an instant reply back and said, did you see one? I said, no. <laughs> I said, I said, I can't comment on, on this platform. In other words, electronic transmission, face to face, yeah. But this said, was Tucker Carlson. You sent this email to? No, this this was uh, a buddy of mine who works for the National Security Agency, and came back and said, "I can't say I can't see anything more, but they're here." Yeah. Hmm. Wow! Oh, there's yes. Terry. <laughs> yeah, that's, Hi, Terry. that's our our filmmaker right there. Oh, okay. Very, yeah. So he's he's the witness of the uh, the triangle I'm talking about. He's in your chat, so that's really very cool. Awesome. Um, but thank you for that. And so um, you feel like there's two categories: theirs and ours, and potentially ours is um, a version of theirs that we have uh, made our own. I'm assuming. Right, right. If if yeah. if what was uh, given to us or captured or crashed, uh, I mean it. And like, do you ever have any inside information? I rub my hands as I say this, um, as to um, potentially any of the aerospace technical engineering corporations that may have links to this technology or potentially I, putting them out. I had a I had a book signing at the Lockheed Skunk Works in June of last year, and I spent two and a half hours with uh, Jeff Babion, who was the vice president general manager of the skunk works. Now he's since retired from the skunk works. I think he had 62 and he retired, but we were heading you now after I get a tour and a book signing, uh, we, we headed over to the U2 operation on the other side of air force plant 42 there at Palmdale. And as we're driving over there, I mean, you know, our faces are what two feet, two and a half feet apart. And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, all right, Jeff, how much alien technology is being utilized in skunk works programs. And almost immediately he came back and he wasn't one, he wasn't surprised by the question. Uh, but he said, I have, I have absolutely no knowledge. And, and when, he, when he's looking at me straight in the eye, he's not looking up as he's talking. I mean, he's looking at me straight in the eye. He said, I have absolutely no knowledge of alien technology using in any of our programs. It doesn't mean that they, they, they weren't developed in the past, but my job is to look to the future. You know, I have to be familiar with the past, and that's one of the reasons he was, you know, so excited about getting my book. You know, seventy-five years of Lockheed Skunk Works, and I cover forty-three programs. There's probably forty-three that I know nothing about, but <laughs> the forty-three was a good start. But he he looked me straight in the eye. He said, "No." I said, "I said I believe. I mean, I believe we can't be alone." Right. And do you so, think he knew his audience there and how he phrased that? Or was that no, a very no. direct answer? Or was it was there an underlying message by looking no, I, at the eye I, and giving you that? No, he's he he told me, he said, 
said, you know, I believe we can't be alone. The universe is just too big. But it's a That's it's great. Lockheed and the and the Skunkberg's official policy. We have no you know we have no stand on UFOs. I think we that's com- great. We don't comment on it. We, we don't speculate on it. It is what it is. Yeah, so, that's a great answer. I mean, that's yeah. a great answer. It's the same answer we get from the head of NASA. So it's yeah. fair. <laughs> I can take that. Yeah, but it, but it, but it, 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 he wasn't one. He wasn't surprised by the question. And his response. He knew, he knew who was asking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and his response was 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 right on. So I have to, you know, I have to believe. And if he was a politician, I would say, yeah, bull, yeah, uh, he's lying through his right. teeth. But he's not a top politician. Yeah, he may be a bureaucrat at Lockheed, uh, but he's uh, he comes across as a great person and you know someone who's not going, you know, who's not going to if. If there was something that was sensitive, if there was something that was classified, he would have said, I can't comment. But he didn't say that. I mean, when when uh, yeah. George Knapp asked Edward Teller, did you suggest Bob Lazar apply for the job at S4? Or did he apply for the job in the desert? He, you know, he didn't respond. No comment. Now, the thing about uh, dealing with classified information, if you're privy to classified information and someone asks you a question that deals with something that's classified, you're going to say no comment or not respond at all. I said, yeah, if Bob was a fraud, if Bob was a fraud, Teller would have to say, I've never heard of him. I don't know who he is. Uh, He's using my name in vain. And... Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's a, he's someone who's pretending to be someone he's not. I knew Bob before he went out to work in the desert. And I met him the day I photographed the F-117. And I I happened to be with John Lear. And I don't know. What a coincidence you all met that day. Yeah. And you know, Bob, you know, Bob told me to my face you know, that uh, he thought John Lear was crazy. He said, said that dumb SOB Lear believes in UFOs. I said, how stupid is that? I mean, his, he's, he's from his world-famous aviation family. His, his dad brought Learjet to the world. Now, this is before he got the job at S4. And he said, I'm a nuclear, yeah. phys- I'm a nuclear physicist. If I can't prove it mathematically or put my hands on it, it doesn't exist. And he, he said, I said, you can put a gun to my head and I, st- I still won't uh, say that UFOs were real. I mean, they, they're not. So well, you were able to kind of witness this shift change in Bob Lazar. And yeah. so that makes his, his story far more compelling um, hearing that, I feel personally. And it must have been for you living it. You probably never doubted him. No, because... The people that would normally doubt him have made no comment on it. Not not the jackasses out there. There's a couple of them. I've been battling with one on on the Blackbird. Why it was terminated? And some guy came back. Well, you now who are you? I said you, you probably didn't. You said if you read any books, and I said, well, probably the books you're reading. I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's interesting that you got to witness Bob Lazar's shift change from somebody that was an absolute skeptic to somebody that was, um, if not a believer, at least somebody that was definitely open because he'd witnessed a technology he he couldn't explain. Um, And I don't think he ever really made any massive claims, really, other than seeing something. No, I mean, Um, his, his... his job was to try to figure out, you know, how the thing worked. How, you know, how did how did his anti gravity system using Element One Fifteen, and he sh- now I didn't I didn't handle it. All he did was show it to me. And this is when we, uh, right after he went to work at S Four. Wait, maybe, what did maybe, he show you? He showed you what the, ele- the uh, Element One Fifteen. He had a piece you, of it. You s- wait, you what? Saw? Wait. <laughs> Lynn, that, right? I've never heard that story. Hold on, oh, Jim. Element one fifteen, Jim. No, Are no, you he, he showed he show me. So this is the, this is the stuff that makes 
it makes the uh, you know creates yeah. anti. That's a yeah. big deal, by the way, Jim. And <laughs> when his house deal. his house was broken into when he was at work at S four, and all his personal papers were taken, his diploma from MIT was taken. Yeah. Uh, Element 115. Now, I, I saw the element Enzo, 115 Enzo, was taken. I, Enzo, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And wow. it's, uh, well, that's, that's new. big yeah. news. <laughs> we haven't heard this part of the story. Oh, no, yeah. I, 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 I'm it, still it, kind it, of it, like it was, digesting that. It was that's, really never. You got to it, hold it, element 115. No, I didn't hold it. He just showed it to me. That's good enough. You were in the presence of it. That, that means it exists. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I've been in presence of a lot of interesting things that doesn't, you know, doesn't, you know, uh, put Please any money in my drop, pocket. drop more, <laughs> drop yeah. more of those details. That no, is incredibly but, interesting. Oh, I mean, and again, I've gone, th I've gone through this before. Uh, but when I was, uh, when I was in the Pentagon for desert shield and desert storm, I had Bob's W2 that was, that he was paid by, uh, to work at S4. Mm -hmm. And I had it in my back pocket. At the time, I was an E6. I was a tech sergeant. How and did you end up with that? What? Just in your back pocket. You just oh, had... he, no, he gave it to me. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I blocked out his social security number. And I'm uh, I'm at the Pentagon, and I have I've I about an hour and a half of just sitting around doing nothing. So I got I got on the computer and I'm looking at the Pentagon directory and I'm looking for the Navy organization that paid Bob and it wasn't anywhere on the Pentagon directory. I mean that covers every every military anything that's associated with DOD, except mm. if it was classified, if it's classified location. Right. And uh, so I decided, you know, that I, I found something that's very similar. I, it may have been. Uh, uh, Naval Investigative Services or something like that. And again, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, so That's I walk so in there. I'm in, uni I'm in uniform. I'm, I, I'm in my light blue shirt, my, my dark blue pants. Uh, and I go in, there's a young Lieutenant JG behind the desk. And I said, sir, can you tell me where this organization is? And I hand him Bob's W-2. He looks at it and said, excuse me for a minute, Sergeant. He gets up. He goes into the two stars office. He's in there 15, 20 seconds. He comes out and he says, the Admiral will see you now. Now, if you know anything about the military, especially, especially the Navy, no two star Admiral, Navy Admiral is going to talk to an Air Force enlisted puke <laughs> over, over anything. Now I've talked with two stars. I've talked with four stars, but I was at a, at a, at a different level. I went in there as an author, and I talked right. to him. So I go in there and I gave him a real sharp salute. And he's he's holding up he's holding up Bob's W two, and he said, Sergeant, I don't know where you got this, but if I ever see your face cross the threshold of my uh, office ever again, you'll be the most sorry son of a bitch in NCO. In the United States military. Do you understand me, Sergeant? I said, yes, sir. Now, normally when you go up and speak to an officer, they say, you know, per, you know, they say at ease. He said parade rest. So I'm there still rigid, hands behind my back. And uh, he takes Bob's W-2 and he puts it into the shredder and he says, Sergeant, you're dismissed. I gave him a sharp salute, did an about face and walked out. Wow. Yeah, Bob was a fraud that would not have happened mm -hmm. he would no two stars mm -hmm. going to take even 30 seconds out of his day you know to, to well sl let's slam just down say and hypothetically for a moment what if you had handed him fake documents would he have responded the same way or do you think he would have been more like I, laid back about it and asked you more detail about it no i think he does the, I think the Lieutenant JG would have noticed, well, no, I have, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know where you got this, but it's, we don't have an organization like that. And off, right. you know, off I'd go. And that's uh, incredible. Gorilla, yeah. Gorilla Gamer wants to know what it looked like. I'm assuming that's the uh, element, element 115. Yeah. It was just a small piece of grayish material metal. 
uh, see, I didn't, I didn't pay that much attention to it because at the time I didn't know the, the importance of it. Yeah. Right. Um, Did you ever talk to George Knapp or any of those guys that are super interested in this story? George and I have been friends for about 40 years. So he definitely knows your story. Oh, absolutely. I've been, I've been on cool. uh, with him uh, Good. on channel eight a program, you know, seven, eight times. That's great. Yeah. I just, I feel like I never got to hear that and hearing it directly from you. Wow. <laughs> I mean, wow. That's so great. I'm so glad that you shared that. Thank well, you the, very much. The, the, the other thing, uh, you know, Bob, Bob told the world and, and he told George, he said, you know, when I worked at Sandia, I, I said on, uh, on weekends, I said, he has a jet car. I've seen it. I've sat in it, not run it's running. And he said, I was written up in the, either the Sandia nurse newspaper or the local Ab Albuquerque newspaper. And it shows professor Bob Lazar works at Sandia developing nuclear weapons. And to relax on the weekends, he drives, he goes 300 miles an hour and a quarter mile. I mean, this is a big thing. It's there's Bob. Yeah. You can't mistake Bob and his glasses. There's Bob awesome. and his jet car behind him. And when he, when George went to Albuquerque, he got into the Sandia library and he has, uh, he's, he's in the non-classified side so he can look at everything. And he got a directory from when Bob said he worked there. So he opens up the book under L's, there's Robert Lazar with the phone number he said that he had. And he looked up the two other guys <clears throat> that he worked in the lab with. Their name was in there as well. Uh, there's just too many things pointing to the fact that Bob is who he says he is. Yeah. And early yeah, on, great. early on, uh, uh, TV company, you know, production companies, whatever, said, well, you know, if if you if you just you know if you just say you saw you saw grays or whatever, and he said, no, I never I I saw references references to them. There were posters in the hallway. They were referred to it as the kids because they were you know they were small, but I never yeah. ever and and he said and the the equipment inside the, the sports model and that was the only one he had access to, even though the propulsion system was similar. Uh, or the same uh, for all nine of the craft that were the air S four, and they were all different shapes and sizes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's yeah, just it's incredible. And, and people have tried to destroy him. Uh, and he, he told me to my face, he said, you know, the biggest, the biggest mistake I ever made in my life is going public on this thing. But he felt right. I, I can he, understand that. He felt threatened. Uh, his uh, his wife had had died, and I'm not sure if it was suspect. It's so disappointing too, isn't it? So disappointing that he had such a massive story, and that's the way the world took it. And and I think a lot of people that experience things kind of get met with that by the world. It's really unfortunate, and it's fine to be skeptical, but I think to you know attack or demean the person that's bringing the message that's just that's just hatred and it's just yeah, hard, no, well, no, it's, hard to it's, swallow it's political it's political crap is what it is uh -huh. but yeah um you know bob bob is i really like bob and bob is smart i mean he had a he had a supercomputer yeah. in his in in his uh office there when he lived off of west charleston I mean, it was a standard 19-inch uh, NEMA rack. It was at six foot, and every slot was filled with processors. And this is back 90, you know, early to mid 90s. I mean, he wow. he had he had computing take. I don't know if they were HP or they were DEC uh, uh, mini computers, but he you know he did everything in code. He I mean he didn't he was he's not a He's a brilliant man, and even even yeah. after even after they they turn everybody turned their back on him, of, you know, saying well he's a fraud, he didn't work at uh, S four. There are guys who fly the red and whites; those are the Janet flights that Dave Fruhoff asked. He said, 
you were, you know, you worked at the test site you know, in the early nine, you know, late eighties, early nineties. Do you ever remember a guy named Lazar, you know, flying in on the Janet flights? And, a, and a, a, I think Dave Fruhoff said at least two of them said, yeah, I, the name sounds familiar and his face looks familiar. So is he real? Is he Memorex? He's, <laughs> and you have to be, you have to be old to remember that. you know, that. You know, yeah. That oh, he's real. He yeah, is he real. Is. He's very I, real. I get it. I get it. And I've seen him talk about his work. Um, and he absolutely knows what he's talking about. He's he's definitely a very well, intelligent person, that's for sure. Yeah, they they were they were able to prove that he worked at uh, Caltech. He was working on a program which you needed, I believe you your minimum educational requirements was a master's degree in physics. Yeah. Uh and he was verified to be working there. To this day, he still has a contract with the Department of Energy to calibrate and work on uh, neutron detectors. So it's it's right up his alley. Wow. And and he again he is he is he has never really uh, varied off of off of the, you know the path that he's on. I mean he's. Every everything he said over the over the last three decades, a lot of it's coming to pass. Yeah, and yeah, and then then I go then I go to my uh, my dear friend Ben Rich, you know, who replaced Kelly Johnson at the Skunk Works, and in yeah. I think it was I think it was ninety six, uh, he was at UCLA. It wasn't the sometime in the nineties. He was at UCLA, and it was uh, a conference of graduate students from this aeronautical school and at the end and this is part of his you know prepared step you know s uh, statement he said we have the ability to take et home and this is the mid 90s but our government our government will not allow that information to be released and then just before he passed away, now Ben and I talk once a quarter for 25 years. I don't know how I got into that routine with him but it was, it was, I was blessed. Yeah. And, wow. and just about just before he, you know, he died, he was, he was at UCL, USC medical center there in LA and he was battling uh, stage four esophageal cancer. He, he's around all the nasty chemicals that make uh, low observable solvents and, and coatings. And that's right. probably, that's probably what caused it. But, but I called him, called him up. I had just gotten his, uh, uh, he, I was the last person to get an autograph book from him. Hmm. And it was uh, the book he did with Leo Janos, uh, My Time at the Skunk Works. And Ben said, he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. Not what you think you can build in 50 years, but what you can comprehend. And I can comprehend a hell, hell of a lot. And if he's seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. And they said, Ben, you want to expand upon that? And he said, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then he had the nerve to die on me 10 days later. So, yeah. But it was, uh, and, and he's, the re he's, he's the reason why we got an A12 Blackbird in Minnesota. Right. Um, he called me in August of 89. He said, they're not the blackbirds aren't going to make it through Congress, and if anybody can scrounge one, you can. So I started working right. on it, and sure shoot, and I got one. <laughs> so that's great. That is an amazing story. I um, yeah, and and I know that. Um, so there was only they decommissioned in 1989, Was it they okay. decommissioned the last one? The, the blackbird. Yeah. No, they, they, the program shut, shut down in January 1990. That was the last official flight, even though right. the record run on 972 going back to Washington, D.C. was on, I think it was on March 9th. And they went from, on a retirement flight, they went from L.A. to D.C. in an hour and four minutes. <laughs> but, but, oh. but the first half of the first half of the trip, they didn't know if they got a full load of fuel. Uh, Blackbird had a ha habit of the uh, fuel level uh, sensors in the, in the tanks. The, right. 
to, to not work sometimes and and everything was so they were flying blind on what their levels were right right you know they knew how much was transferred from the you know, the kc-135 q but they didn't know how you know they weren't sure what their left with the uh how much they'd use on the on the first half of the trip and right about st louis is where it, it popped up and they realized they had enough fuel to fire firewall the airplane so they advanced the throttles they went from St. Louis to Cincinnati in eight minutes. Oh my gosh! And Ben Rich told me <laughs> Ben Rich told me that if if the, if they could have uh, red redlined from the beginning to the end of the trip, it would have been like forty seven minutes coast to coast. That on is incredible. Trip. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. No and wonder it did, it's your favorite. And it did leak out uh, quite a bit. Uh, Enzo is saying that uh, they leaked out like a sieve. It would. Uh, during combat operations at Kadena, when the when the Blackbird left uh, the T hangers there, in, I think it's Area 19 at Kadena, Okinawa, there would between two and four inches of fuel on the hangar floor. You would leak or consume 800 pounds of fuel, 800 or 8,000 pounds of fuel before you took off. Before your before your tires wow. left the ground. Now the airplane holds 100,000 yeah. pounds of fuel. Uh, but it would wow. leak that much, and then we like someone on top of the on top of the airplane with hoses turned on all the way, and that's how much fuel is pouring out of the airplane. The ground crew, the guys that work on it, maintain it, prep it, and everything else, they get brand new boots every ninety days because JP seven rots the neoprene soles off their shoes. Oh my gosh! And it's real wow. slimy feeling. Oh yeah, so, that uh, must have been. Bizarre. And it's non-flammable. Uh, on the first uh, first public showing of the Blackbird in, at Andrews Air Force Base in D.C., the F fuels NCO, he was an E-8 uh, senior master sergeant. He's sitting on the fuel cart. There's pans underneath the airplane, fuels dripping out. And he sees the fire inspector and he says, I got, I got to pull something on him. I don't, you know, this is going to be fun. So here he's sitting on the fuel cart. He pulls out a cigarette and he lights it. And the, and the fire marshal says, what the hell are you doing? Put that cigarette out. And he goes, and he flips it into the pan of fuel. And he said, the fire marshal just hit the deck. Nothing happened. And you know, the, the, the senior master sergeant is, you know, he's just laughing. He said, well, and that stuff, you can put it in a fire extinguisher and put out fires with it. But that's great. He didn't that's find great. any. The fire marshal didn't know. <laughs> yeah, but the, the fire marshal didn't have it. You know, didn't you know, didn't have a sense of humor, and the guy lost. That is great. One or one or two stripes, but only for thirty days. He got him back <laughs> afterwards. But I love uh, that. That is great. I mean, there's there's so many crazy stories with the Blackbird. You know, that's why I've written five books on it. I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. It's fantastic. So now we now we have to get into your experiences. We've talked about mine for what? Yeah, th over thirty minutes. So let's I see. appreciate it. I mean, that's we've scratched the surface. And thank you so much for sharing that stuff with me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's it's all up here, and, and and people ask me, well, what what are you not sharing with us? I, said, no, I don't <laughs> I don't I don't keep anything away from you know from this that's great. From this audience. Because if we I were to walk it. out the door today to go check mail and drop over dead, everything I have up here, it's gone. That's so right. If I see something or hear something or do something that has, you know, that has any impact or any interest on anybody in the aviation or spooky airplane or things that go bump in the night UFO categories, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it be known. I'm gonna, it's going to be documented somewhere. We need to uh, upload your consciousness somewhere, buddy. Oh, oh, no, you can't do that. No, no. The world may come to an end. So <laughs> That's, that, would be uh, that would be very dangerous. So. An AI Jim Goodall. I yes. love it. <laughs> well, you'll be here in perpetuity, Jim. Yeah. Right here. Well, I know I know. As, as far as there's, there's a library of Congress, I'll have 29 books in there. So That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I, and I hate writing. I really do. <laughs> the it physical shows. aspect yeah. of it, but you're, 
I could see that. It's extremely creative. And I mean, obviously you're an amazing storyteller, so it's natural for you. Yeah. But um, I could see how the physical laborious <laughs> act of writing could be a little bit boring. Well, and, and, and one of the problems I run into when I'm writing is I'm thinking about 10 sentences ahead and as I'm going. Right. And I'll get a little recorder. Maybe I'll think that I had, rec I had typed something out when I, when I did in my mind, but I didn't do it on, you know, on the computer. Oh, right. Yeah. I knew, I knew it was the, with those blanks words are supposed to be, <laughs> I mean, the ones but I we don't as your audience. Right. I love right. that. That's great. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about you. Let's talk yes. about your experiences and uh, sure. what, what happened on sure, Bainbridge sure. Island. Right. So um, at the time, so this was July 5th of 2019 that this event took place. Um, and it was on the island of Bainbridge Island, which is across the Puget Sound from Seattle. Um, and so at the time, um, I was a, a commercial filmmaker and working in narrative film and national spots uh, for commercials. And so um, on this particular day, um, there are nine family, family members in total that were down at Rockaway Beach. And they were all down there because it was the lowest tide of the year. And so they would be able to investigate caves and things that were around that area that normally you wouldn't be able to get access to on foot. So um, it's around two o'clock in the afternoon and my wife, myself, and um, our second oldest son had stayed back at the house uh, to prep for um, an early dinner. And so around two o'clock, I decided to take the truck down and go ahead and help getting all the family back up to the house. Even though the beach is close to our house, it was still a little bit of a hike and it's uphill. So I, I decided to drive down there. So um, I headed down and parked and um, made my way to the area at the beach, uh, beach side where there's kind of an elevated portion with a bench. Uh, and my mother and father were seated at that bench. So that's where I approached initially. And as I did so, I noticed, so the ocean being on my left and the bench on my right, I noticed on the left, most of the family members were making their way up towards us. So their adventures were at nearing, nearing the end. So I'd timed it really well. So um, as I approached my mom and dad, my mom's attention was kind of up and over my shoulder um, looking and looking up into the sky and, um, at which point she said, did you hear that? And I was like, no, I, I didn't hear anything. Um, and at which point at the same time, my sister's son who was down on the beach yells and points up in the sky and says, oh, look, a saucer in those exact words. <laughs> and so, um, the whole family's attention was drawn to what was clearly a disc just sitting in the sky above us. Um, and I was like, whoa, like, what is that? And um, I reached for my phone because I was like, I'm going to get a picture of this bad boy. And um, I realized I didn't have my phone. So I dashed about 50 yards or so back up to my truck and grabbed my phone and came back down and stood right in the same position. And um, the object wasn't there, but I still took a photograph of the cloud that it had been near, if that makes any sense. Um, and um, the family's attention was kind of like now off in the distance. So I looked to where they were, their gaze was and um, I moved my phone and took a second photograph. And um, you could still see what was now the disc off in the distance. And at which point, this is where I noticed that the disc kind of had what appeared to be like a little sparkle around it. Um, it would be at 12 o'clock and then 6 and then 9 and 3 o'clock. And the sparkle, when I looked at it a little closer, appeared to be what looks like a, a quote unquote Tic Tac or white cigar, right? And when um, the sun or the light was hitting it just right, it was sparkling. And 
Um, my mom described how it was acting around the disc as a hummingbird around a flower, how it's always pointing towards the flower, but here and then there. And, um, so are my, as I'm taking these photographs, um, I was trying to get good photos and I, I wasn't able to see it in my phone, uh, which was an iPhone. Two. Uh, one. I forget which I forget which model now, but um, it was it was a pretty recent model for the year. Um, I was trying to I couldn't see very well in, in my screen. So I was more or less photographing the clouds that I would see it with my naked eye. I would photograph a cloud near it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, OK, so as I'm photographing it, it was behaving very strangely where it wouldn't so much fly as disappear and then reappear but in rapid succession. Um, so it would be there and then there and then there and then there. And I wouldn't see it in between. Sometimes it would be totally gone, I guess, um, is the best way to describe it. And then um, my father cries out over my right shoulder, oh, well, what's this down there? And he's pointing and I, I moved my gaze down and um, fixated on the group of objects. Now, it was very clear, a disc and the tic tac, we'll call it that for now, were just sitting in the air. Um, and so they had moved from where I was photographing them down to almost West Seattle in, I mean, a blink of an eye. Like it was the same group of objects in two, two locations almost at the same time is what it, you know, appeared because it was so quick. Anyways, um, so the saucer, um, stopped and the tic tac stopped at which point the tic tac and this is where you guys have to suspend your disbelief and like this is a hard part of the story actually to talk about because um it just i don't know it makes me breathless and it's it's hard to wrap your head around so the tic tac just stops and fires what appears to be a beam of light that just starts and like grows a beam of light of which starts to open up into what it ends up being a perfect box, a 3D box of light in the sky. Mm. Bright, bright box of white light. And so my whole family is looking into this box of light and something either exited, exits or enters that box of light. Um, it was hard to tell. It just dims for a second. And so we assumed something went in or out. Um, during this time, that box didn't move. The tic tac didn't move. None of the objects moved. They were static in the sky for almost a full minute, minute and a half, because from the first photograph to the end is two and a half minutes. And we were staring into that light. And um, anyways, um, that duration ends and um, it basically does the reverse. So the box, goes back up into the beam and the beam retracts back up into the tic tac and the group of objects move in the same um, stop start appear disappear into the distance rapidly and i got one final photograph so i have a series of 10 and lynn yeah. if you want to share those yeah let me just um, up for you i would love to yeah. go over it briefly with you again um and i'm sorry you have to understand it i get very shaky over this it's 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 actually a little disturbing to recall and there are a few aspects like the second time when that um when so when that light and that beam was taking place um there was a sound that i heard um and i'm assuming it's the same description as what my mother had initially heard um and so that sound I can describe as on a large scale coming obviously from the sky as if you're listening to thunder on that level, except it was a sound of like um, rubber stretching, like that sound of elastic, kind of like like a, like a stretching sound, but a little bit more metallic. Um, and that description is actually my mom's, but it, it really does um, hit it well. So this is the first photo when it was off in the distance. And um, yeah, so photo one. And just you can just make it out in the, in the large. So these are basically 
um, zoom, I had cropped this photo and zoomed in so you could see the disc. Mm -hmm. And in the, mm -hmm. the bottom left square, I had done a little bit of contrast enhance. Um, so just to bring up some of the definition. Um, now, is this a photograph of the actual disc I was seeing or something else? I don't know. Like I said, I was shooting at the clouds. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty okay photo. I, there are better ones. Like I said, the way this thing moved was just bizarre. But um, any questions you guys have or any details as we move forward? Um, the next photograph, if you want to go to that, and we can go back. Um, this, again, um, I had zoomed in, and I feel like that perhaps was a bit of a mistake, but I had tr attempted to zoom in with my camera and um, got this photograph, which is, um, you know, a few people have come to me and said, oh, it looks you know, like a helicopter or a plane or a bird. And you could absolutely be right. I'm not saying this is, you know, an alien ship or anything. I'm just saying it, it is potentially what we were seeing with our naked eye. And what we were seeing with our naked eye was moving in an incredible way that no plane, helicopter, or bird could potentially hope to move. Mm -hmm. And so let's, if we skip forward to number three here, mm -hmm. Um, that's a pretty good look at what we were seeing with our naked yeah. eye. And that's not zoomed in. Okay. Um, and so when that thing was just sitting static, you would get, like, I was able to get this clear shot. Um, in the following frame in number four, I believe mm -hmm. that we have a blank sky. Huh. And the fact of the matter is, is there should have been something there because I saw it with my naked eye, but I included this simply for the fact that there was nothing in the frame. Mm. So when you took this, as important. you were still seeing something. I could see something. I took the photograph, and then there was nothing in the photograph. Interesting. Uh, demonstrating kind of how it was popping in and out visually um, as it was moving across the sky. Um, and then number five, this is, um, you can actually make out the Tic Tac a little bit. Um, in the bottom left where I brought the contrast up and it's behind it just Here? to the left. That is exactly correct. Okay, interesting. And so this is the, the saucer the... here that you saw. Correct. This is the yep. TikTok back here. Yeah. Okay. And um, so it was certain, like still, even though this object, so the saucer would move, but you would still see that sparkle. Hmm at different places every time you would see the saucer you would see a sparkle it would be sparkling in different objects and then it would disappear and then it'd be somewhere else it would have this weird sparkle it would disappear but rapidly hmm. I mean, so the sparkle than wasn't like it. a light on it that was rotating it was more just sparkling around it it was the other object catching the light or mm -hmm. doing something i don't oh, okay. i don't know but it, okay. it looked like a sparkler Okay. Like if you were holding a sparkler off yeah. in the distance, a real sparkle. Wow. Um, and then in the, the next photograph, I think we're going to see, this is the box opening. Oh, so wow. as soon as my, this is when my dad said, look down here now. And so I had started taking this photograph. And so that's the Tic Tac. I had okay. done some enhancement in the bottom left there. That's the Tic Tac. There's a very vague, but you can see a beam mm. attaching it to what is now opening up a box of right. light. And so right at the, the corners there, at the closest point, mm. is where the beam is. And you can kind of see it in all of them, mm. but in, in the large box, you can clearly see it. Yeah, right there in that, in that photo. You can That's see right. it pretty well. Wow. And so in the next photo, this is where it is almost completely wide open. And we see something at this point either exiting or entering. Is that what this dark area is? The dark area. And so visually, we were able to see that as well. Wow. Um, and so that did happen more than one time. But I don't know if things were coming and going or entering or exiting or 
or what you would just see it dim for a moment hmm. and then in this next photo you see it the portal or the white box clearly open hmm. with a very bizarre hazing going on around it again with a dark spot in the center hmm. um and you can actually make the tic tac out which is up and to the right all right here um, the yep yeah. yep still hovering static um in the next photograph we see it recoiling back up in mm. in a really bizarre and unearthly way that threw us off so was this the saucer part here that's that's actually the tic tac oh okay i know that seems blurry and bizarre but that was the tic tac and below it is the box recoiling up okay at which point in the next photo there was a new object that i got an okay photo of there and I, I enhanced it as much as i could it to the naked eye there it looked like a triangle mm. um or like a pyramid more than a triangle like a pyramid not a triangle because those are two different things yeah. so this was looked like a pyramid we still saw the saucer and the tic tac but those were the only three objects at the end that we saw move off south so that would be to the right in this photograph wow. and and that's the end of the photos um yeah so i mean that there's an aspect of like that light that my family has an issue with and um you know the dreams that lingered from that sort of thing um the ages ranged at the time from six to 86 um and of which uh, two ex-military and three PhDs, um, two people in the medical field, and myself. Um, so definitely people that weren't thinking UFO, that had never entered into our purview before this. So none, n n neither myself nor any family member was um, an avid UFO believer. I think the only other time we'd ever talked about it was literally when we had seen close encounters. Um, so this wasn't our first go-to by any stretch. In fact, we did, when we got home, I sent the photos to my dad's iPad and we all scrutinized the photos and, and you know, came up with everything from holographic imaging to tests that my family is aware of that the military may do. And we're aware that within 10 miles is Bangor, B-A-N-G-O-R military base, which is um, a nuclear sub base, um, you know, and just knowing all those details and how close you are to airports, um, we decided to report it to agencies and confirm that it was nothing mundane before we mm -hmm. leapt into something bizarre, even though you got to know every one of us were shaken by this. I mean, some of the photographs I took after this were like of the hubcap of my truck of some bushes. Wow. Like I was not thinking my normal clarity, like even the drive home. I don't really remember. Um, yeah. yeah um, you know, and the, the strange dreams started that night uh, with all of us and we can, I prefer not to talk in too much depth about that, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, offline, I'm willing to share. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we ended up with more questions than answers. Um, we definitely cleared it with MUFON. We cleared it with um, a couple other agencies that confirmed that it wasn't our aviation at the time. Huh. Um, MUFON came back with it being the 3 to 5% of UAP unexplainable. Hmm. Um, okay. So Xavier wanted to know, so were any of your kids with you at the time, Tim? And how were they affected? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, my children were affected in, in the way that, you know, they didn't know what it was hmm. and that they, you know, have a, a lingering question of what that is. Um, I don't think we ever said, you know, aliens or UFOs around them, I, because that's not like what my family talks about or ever even considered amongst ourselves. We'd never said those words. So it's not like my 
my family members, even the young ones, are asking about aliens and UFOs. They're not. They're mm -hmm. just wondering why they have strange dreams and the descriptions of the dreams are all kind of matching amongst themselves and things like that. So whatever the effect is, they're all, you know, sharing in that um, psychological or emotional effect from the exposure, simple wow. at this point. Wow. Um, Michigan UFO sightings and paranormal encounters wants to know. So now you looked and see if there were any um, aircraft yeah, in the area. I right? wish it was just a plane towing a banner. It so looks like that. And I get that. Um you know, and if only it had been that there was, so it couldn't have been that. And by there's, they don't retract banners back up into planes. They actually have a really cool uh, fly down and hook system for getting banners. So there's no way this could have retracted up into a plane, you know, flying a banner. And um, again, I would just say that it, they would have confirmed that there was some kind of aviation taking place in that area mm -hmm. um, was a second one. And then again, MUFON's um, research looked at how long this thing stayed static in the air and no plane and banner can stay motionless for a minute and a half in the air, unfortunately. But yes, I wish this was simply explained by a banner or a plane or a hologram or a balloon. Um, we definitely looked for those explanations deeply before we decided to come and make it public like this. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely understand. And please, skeptics, come forward with anything um, or anyone that may have seen something around the same time, please come forward with it. I'm yeah. open to anything, be it mundane or not. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, this, let me see if I can go back and find the picture. Um, I mean, so, yeah, these pictures are really interesting. They are super triggering for me personally, actually. Oh, but, she was yeah. trying to take them down. Like, well, you know, like I said, you. like staring at, like staring into that light for so mm -hmm. long, like had a, a lingering effect. Like there, I'm not sure what that is but huh. um you know yeah it was it was bizarre it was a bizarre experience yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah. Mm. i mean have you ever heard of anything like this jim in, in your experience uh, as far as, far as a, a portal opening up and you know and having objects go in and out or disappear once they go into the box um, yeah, uh, there's there's been I I read you know there's there's reports that there's you know the sky sort of opens up and things go in and things go out of it. Um, Have you ever heard of anything technical like this where it seems like technology is creating a, no. a specific boundary of light? No, no, and it, and they wouldn't be doing it over the Olympic Peninsula. Mm. If you know, if they, if something like this was being utilized for for whatever reason, it would you know it would have been tested in Nevada or it'd be tested out you know out, out on the Pacific somewhere either off right. of San Clemente Island um, or even uh, go out to Barking Sands there in Kauai. Uh, you know they have they have all sorts of specialized uh, tracking cameras you know primarily for hmm. uh, ballistic missile uh, reentry vehicle research. And testing so right no it's just weird i mean it's it's fantastic um very unusual i mean it's just yeah you know, i mean you, you can ask me anything uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings i'm not emotionally attached to the sighting or anything if you wanted to pick it apart i would probably help you no like, i mean it would be easy for me to just call this something simple um you well, know, the, then... this, the spark, the sparkling on on the the object that uh, the t whether it was a tic tac or the other uh, the other object, you're in the Pacific Northwest. You know, there isn't a lot of sun out there. Did, you know, was it a sunny day? It doesn't it doesn't look no, like not it. particularly no. So you, so you yeah uh, you wouldn't be getting sunlight glints off of an object. Those you know those are being uh, radi radiated out from you know from the craft and you would only have it on the the area closest to the light source which would be the sun 
And if you're having it at, at 12 o'clock, at three o'clock, at six o'clock and nine o'clock, that tells me that's something that's coming, that's being generated from the object itself. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It absolutely and, does. And again, and with, with, with no direct sunlight, I mean, there's no shadows there. You know, you look across, uh, you know, towards the other side of the island there and, uh, it's not a bright sunny day, so you're not going to have you're not going to have the shining or the reflection off of the object, especially not at in four distinct ninety degrees apart from each other uh, effect. So, right. That, um, that, I I wanted to check out one other nugget, and so in the beginning, I just let you guys know that this happened on July fifth of twenty nineteen. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that some people have kind of disregarded some of the information released um, about the sighting that took place on the, I think it was the Omaha, perhaps 10 days after this sighting. Well, it's almost exactly a thousand miles from this on the same coast. And I may have like in photograph 10, potentially captured something similar. I know that Corbell released something that was an orb and something else that were pyramids. And we decided that the pyramids were actually, you know, mirroring uh, or refractions off mirrors within the gear that the guys were using. So, right, right. Um, so they weren't necessarily triangles. But this sighting took place 10 days from that on the same coast. And um, I have to say, it made me kind of wonder if they were connected. I'm not assuming they are, but I wondered if they if they were. And it was also a little bit more motivating for me to come out publicly and see if my sighting had any connection and would be mm -hmm. of use. Um, you know, and it's not easy, by the way, to stand behind blurry photographs and be like, hey, you know, this is what happened. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially being um, a civilian, that's a little bit harder. Um, but you know, my family was really convinced. I was really convinced. And it was one of those things where we were just, we had no choice. And people that were bravely coming out, like uh, Fravor and, and all the people that have been coming out, I think were hugely motivating for my family to, you know, put some wind in my sails to at least, you know, do this. And you got to know, my whole purview of my world has shifted towards this topic. Like, this is what I do with my time now. I'm, my career has shifted towards this topic. And it's not by choice. It's by the pure fact of that this is probably, in my opinion, like one of the greatest scientific investigations and explorations of our time, in my opinion, that it's a mystery. It's a massive mystery. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really into finding out some truth, even if it's mundane, that would be great. Let, let's just get to that truth. And that's, you know, that's the path I'm on right now. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, if your entire family and extended family and friends saw this object, it isn't, it, you know, it's, it isn't something that you created in your mind and decided that I want to see. I mean, you have one, you have documentation, you have images of it. Even, even though you don't have a, you didn't have your Nikon 850 with a 600 millimeter lens in it. We'll forgive you for that right. because that set you back a few bucks. Um, right. It's, I, I just, I, I, what pains me One, I'm delighted. I'm actually thrilled uh, that you were able to shoot these, but but the prop, the problem is, you're shooting it with a, with a with a thing you sit and you have in your back pocket. You need something with yeah. good glass and good range. I'm not talking about you personally, but you know, guys who go out there, you know, men and women who go out there and, and see something, and it's just they shoot it with their with their iPhone, and it's at least it's being documented. But it need someone needs. You know, to be you know dragging around their you know their thirty five millimeter yes. with good glass, uh, and be able to get something with sharp edges, something that isn't fuzzy. Now I have yeah you know, I have some great software that I've uh, uh, I've been using now for about a year, and it's uh, it's 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 magical and it's from Topaz Labs, 
Now, I don't get anything from them. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who's an artist for Disney, uh, you know, and I asked him, I said, okay, what do you, what do you use? And he said, you can't, for the money, you can't beat it. And, he, and there's, there's three things that they have. And one is, uh, one is to remove uh, uh, motion, one is to sharpen edges, and one is to actually to uh, enhance uh, faces. And it's, yeah, it's using it, you know, artificial intelligence. And I get a new update about once, once every uh, 10 to 15 days, I get an update on, uh, you know, on, on that same software. So it, it gets better every, you know, every month that goes by, yeah. that software gets a little bit better. Yeah. And Jim, I, I applaud you. Your thinking is exactly where my thinking, this event, I shot it with my phone. I wanted to come up with better data immediately. And so the filmmaker, the documentarian, the the investigator, the the wondering in me drove me to do exactly what you're saying is to get the better gear, assemble a team and find some clear evidence that is at least undeniable to me. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm looking for my own personal answers. Oh, absolutely. Right? And absolutely. I'm just going to be sharing them with you, you know, the world as I go. But ultimately, yeah. I think that you're absolutely right that we need that better data all the time. I completely mm -hmm. agree with you. No, I, this, I have, is just, this is just frustrating. You're so yeah. right. I, I, have a, I have a dear friend in Amarillo, Texas, Steve Douglas, who is, he's one of the original interceptors. There was a group of us, about 10 or 12 of us, that spent a lot of time out in the desert in the 90s. And he's one of them. But he's he does electronic surveillance. But he's, he's a news director now, and he carries his uh, Nikon P1000. It has a fixed lens. You can't take the lens off. And I think, I think it's, I think it's 24, uh, uh, FPS, yeah, you know, DPI, you know, megapixels. And this thing goes from 35 millimeter to 3000 millimeter. Wow. And with, back in November, November of 18, he, he went up and he shot what he thought were, th were two B2s in formation, probably at 35,000 feet. I mean, they were definitely Batmobiles. You can, you can see that they were, <laughs> yeah. there was no fuselage. So he, he, sent the, he sent the raw data to me. I just started fooling around with it on Photoshop. And when I hit, uh, when I hit tone, it went from just sort of a light blue and a little bit darker light blue and a contrail. And as soon as I hit this thing, it popped up. I mean, it was, I mean, it just jumped out at me. And it was a, the B2, if you look at a shot from either the top or the bottom, the B2 has five trailing edge points. This one only had three. The one next to it was a B2. It had five. And you can see them right together. And I scaled it. And the object was about 125 to 135 foot wingspan, <laughs> which is consistent with uh, the RQ-180. And it also had gear doors that had the same art type of artwork that the B2s have. You know, that's where they put, you know, the spirit of Pennsylvania, spirit of America, whatever. And uh, you, can, you can see the similarities between the two. And if it was a prototype B21, now this is, this is not a UFO, I mean, this is a, you know, but I was, you know, I was amazed at, the, at what I was able to, you know, pull out of that uh, uh, photo, you know, that photo, even though it was green, it looked like he really had nothing there. And, and boy, as soon as I hit it, and I played around with it, I you know I changed the you know, went through the contrast, the you know the color, everything else, and it was it was pretty hard to deny that what we were looking at was not the B two, but something in the same family, something built by Northrop. And it may be it may be the B twenty one, it may be the RQ one eighty, so it's it's unknown, but. That it's a good camera. It's a great camera, and yeah, you, you, know, you keep it in your back seat or you know in the, in the passenger seat. You see something, shoot it. Tripod. Also. Yeah. Well, no. If you if you get out, you can always use your you can always use your uh, car as a uh, something that's oh, stable. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. 
I know when I first time I, I shot uh, Tonopah test range, uh, I was, you know, I didn't have a tripod, but I was using a fence post. It worked just fine. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's yeah. great. I mean, now I'm always prepared. I do travel with gear. And whenever I leave the house, I look up first. I mean, it's just yeah. after you have something that's unexplainable to you, it changes everything. Like, I'm very prepared to have something happen. Like, and they do, it does happen. And I have been prepared and it's fantastic. Like I am getting better data, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's still that initial sighting. I don't, you know, I, I've never heard of anything like it. I I don't expect to ever have another experience like that. Um, But at the same rate, I do think that it's happening all the time. Maybe not on that level or that exact thing, but I do feel very confident that um, the phenomenon is taking place all the time. Um, If you have the right gear, you'd be able to capture it. And so like I I use a psionics camera, which is pretty much a a prosumer um, IR, you know, um, it's actually a color IR uh, Mm -hmm. camera that is pretty affordable and you can definitely distinguish things that are moving in the night sky um, erratically or that shouldn't be there. Uh Um, You know, and then you you take uh, a reading and you can actually there's software now, plenty of apps that people can like ABS to just go ahead and make sure you're not looking at aviation. You can look at satellite trackers. You you can confirm some, you know, within a minute. You can confirm what what it's not. Yeah, exactly. You can always do that. And, And so I keep those things, those tools around me um, and I'm always prepared. I think right. that's that's really it. Once you have the experience, it teaches you you need to be prepared better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Well, I I have I have I don't have a uh, a new Nikon. I have a five uh, six ten. Uh, it's still twenty four megapixels, and I have mm-hmm. really, I have really good Nikon glass. And I I only go up to two hundred millimeter, and I'm very tempted. Been very very tempted to you know buy a buy the six hundred millimeter. Uh, right. When right. it weighs it weighs a ton and it's thousands of dollars and yeah, at one time I was part of the uh, Nikon professional shooters uh, group. Oh, and, cool! And because you know because of divorces and whatever, I you know th- that went you know, went by the wayside. Hmm. And I I may I may try to get back into it because they will they will lend you a six hundred millimeter lens. For a certain huh. you know period of time, you have to pay for yeah. the insurance on it. They'll ship it to your location wherever you want to be, and they, then you'll sh- you know then it's ship it back. I don't I don't know if there, I don't I can't remember I don't I, there was no there was no money involved in leasing it or renting the uh, telephoto <laughs> lens. But it's uh, I'm I'm going to have to talk to Jay Miller. He was my contact. Jay is is Mr. Aviation for Texas. And he's the one, one of the reasons I got into write, writing because I used to support a lot of his books with my photography. And uh, I got, you know, I finally got to a point where uh, I, I started, I wanted to put something together. I had enough, I had enough stuff that I'd shot. So, you know, Jay, but Jay is uh, I- intimately involved with and close with the, the, everybody at Nikon corporate. And yeah. they get a new lens, you know, he gets it. And same with uh, wow. Kats- Katsu Takanoga. He's, uh, he's the, the probably the most, best aviation photographer around. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an opportunity in October when I'm in the sound. Pardon? Let me. Oh, can you hear us okay, Tim? Can you? I'm testing one, two, three, testing. You're back. I'm okay. back. I didn't, I, yes. didn't know I, I didn't know I left. <laughs> I, uh, I, think again. Yeah. I think it's a cable. Uh, Is it? I me? have. I think I so. Have, I can hear him. Yeah. You can put, put in the other one. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. I, 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 I hope to have an opportunity in October to meet with a friend of mine who uh, I believe is now retired from the NSA. And she can chat. But she won't. That's won't, great. She won't do it. She won't do it over the airwaves. So she won't oh, do it by phone right. or by 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 text. But I want to sit down mm-hmm. with her face to face and see if she'll do a data dump on me. 
Yes. Yeah. And then share <laughs> with us. Yeah. Right. Off, offline. Of yeah. No, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask her if, I'm gonna ask her if I can record the conversation. Mm. I don't know. If, I don't know if uh, if she will. Yeah. Pre- Maybe I you could not. just take notes or just yeah. take notes. I mean, that's that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's great. I have I have stacks of notes. <laughs> I mean, I, I bet you I've do. Been, You're a writer. I've been, I've been doing this for fifty years. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and I and I started doing it long before there was an internet. So if you wanted to talk with right. someone, if you wanted to see something, you had to get in in a car or get an airplane <clears throat> or whatever, and go to that location and track that person or persons down. And you know, the internet has made it real easy for a lot of your armchair, uh, spooky airplane you know, people. Mm-hmm. Right. And the, one, right. the ones, the ones that I just love are the ones that have never left their mother's basement, but they're the experts on everything. And right. Um, and I've had, I've had uh, some go, I, some go arounds with some UFO people that, uh, uh, at first I didn't know who they, I, I had forgotten who they were because one of them, spent the last 10 years in prison so oh, geez. <laughs> oh. yeah hey yeah. jim i've yeah. i have a, a a good one here um i'm just wondering for you and your experience um what would be the best case that you feel exists that has some evidence behind it um be it recent or historical do you think that there's a good case out there well i, I think the the bent water is event the one that landed in england uh, at you know, Bent, Bentwater's RAF base, and with the early '80s, where the wing commander has come out, he's been on. You know, he's you know he's talked about it. Public, of, you know, not public affairs. You know, security people have talked about it. Yeah. And when I was in, it's, this had to be 80, 83, 84 time frame. I was in Clovis, New Mexico. I had gone to Cannon Air Force Base to photograph their F-111s. And the public affairs guy was a black kid. He was, I think he was a staff sergeant. E4, no correct, yeah, E5, excuse me. And we're heading towards the flight line. And I said, well, where where were you before you you came to uh, Cannon Air Force Base? I said, well, I was in Bentwaters in England. Oh my gosh. I said, oh, you were there when the UFO landed. He (laughs) slams on the brakes. And the guy turned the guy turned gray. I mean, he went from being a very pretty color brown to a color gray. Mm-hmm. And his, I mean, his eyes were this big. And he said, he said, you say make one more comment about that. I'll have you escorted off the base and you'll not be allowed wow. to ever come back. Wow. Do we understand? Wow. I said, Yes, sir. So I didn't say another word with him the rest of the time. You know, we went out the flight oh, line. I did, you know, I, you know, I did all my photography. Um, wow. But I, if if Bent Waters had been a ruse or had been pretend or been a make make believe type of event, I don't think he would have had that reaction. Yeah. And right. there was, I think and, you're and, right. And because it was on a military facility, you know, they it's probably documented. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, Lynn, do you want to <laughs> shift gears slightly and um, talk about BFR a little bit? Sure. Of course. Do you think that Jim would be up for talking about um, a, an intense video that was from there? Can we show it or talk about so. it? What do you think? We can. Okay. So I wasn't able to take stills. I was trying to get, because the way I that know. this gets distorted it, is you, so there's interesting. There's no good still. But, it, yeah, but as a still, yeah. it just looks like a picture. So I just grabbed a picture that I had and I was able to detach the audio. So okay. I can play that so we can hear the audio distortion. Um, Excellent. So I'll give them. I'll give a brief setup here for Jim and the audience. And so um, we went to Blind Frog Ranch uh, on a tour of the ranch. And so this is up in Vernal, Utah, up in the Uinta Basin. And so we were taken up to the location. And um, the we were the first tour group of the day. And so we definitely had experiences up there that we can talk about some other time. Um, But uh, the experience that we're going to talk about in this video of today took place on the tour group that took place right after us around, I believe, midday. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, 
one of the tour group members and I have her name and I'd love to give her credit. Yeah, um, and so her name is Melinda Greer and Melinda was on this tour group and she filmed um, unbeknownst to her some very interesting video. Um, and so just to briefly describe it. And so she shot um, in portrait mode like so. Um, scanning the area um, as she was just appreciating um, the surroundings and listening to the tour guide uh, talk about the, uh, the the area, the location. And um, as she's scanning and filming, we suddenly snap on with a very strange buzzing feedback that some people have described as a met metallic loud cicada but a little bit perhaps more electronic driven mm -hmm. um, or uh, you, well, well, are we able to hear it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. we'll be able to hear it. Great. Yeah. Um, and in coordination with that sound starting and finishing, cause it does start and stop twice in the, in the clip, we get a wavy distortion in the video that is very um Obviously not um, just a glitch in the phone. It's the only time it's ever done this. It's obviously being affected by something in the area. I mean, as an observer, I think it's going to be very obvious to anyone that sees it that this isn't just a glitch in the phone or just a, a, an object of her zooming in or out um, because she does do that in the clip. Um, the coordination of the sound finishing and ending with the distortion in the video, I think also expresses that there's something else at work here. Um, and so we can start showing it, but um, let's also consider that a lot of people that just walk on the ranch visually with their naked eye have described um, what they can only call a, a wave or a distortion in a, in a specific area. So between two trees, there was a wavy distortion or this rock wall. When I looked at it, even though the sun was clearly shining on it, there was a wavy distortion in front of it and they're only meters away. So the kind of distortion you would get off of a hot road in the summer, somewhere yeah. up in Jim's Jim's neck of the woods, sure. uh, a, a mirage. Yeah. Um, but that, that's not what people are seeing. They're very much up close. And so um, people, uh, the native people up there have been drawing on the walls up there for eons. And they're drawing kind of this uh, wavy lines. They'll draw wavy lines on the, on the rock walls. They'll show people half in, half out of these wavy lines as if it's a distortion that's something recordable or something that's interactable. Not to mention the little that's gray on the petroglyph. Oh, okay, <laughs> could, it gray. Be a, could it be a portal? Well, absolutely. Potentially. Yeah. That's what they think. That yeah. is what they think. Um, and their artwork depicts that. In, in fact, our good friend Carl Vibe, yeah. um, he is focusing exactly on the potential that this is a portal. And he's researching what's called the Magic Mesa out in the Uinta Basin that is reacting somehow to talking to it. Consciousness, yeah, perhaps. Amazing. Um, lighting up, you know, to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. Just some incredible stuff. So this yeah. is definitely an incredible part of the world. And this little piece of video that Melinda captured um, unbeknownst to her is just one slice of that magic up there. Yeah. yeah. So just so everyone knows, uh, we can't show the visual part of the video because Blind Frog Ranch, you may have heard of it. They have a show on um, the History Channel. Um, so because they're still under contract, we can't show the video portion of it. But I was able to separate the audio and you'll see just a picture that that I took while I was there um, that I've because I have to have something visual in order to play it on StreamYard. Um, so you'll just That's see great. a picture of like the ridge that it took place, I think, kind of near it. Uh, so let me see. So now I... I started it where it starts the distortion. So you'll hear, you'll Perfect. hear some people talking in the background. It's slow, it's low and then it gets louder. So, um, and then yeah, okay. It's, it's weird. It's really it's weird, weird because it's like, when it you is. say it's a wave distortion, it's hard to picture what you mean. Cause you think of like, when you see the lines on, like that's what I thought of, but it looks like, like when you see a flag kind of rippling in the wind, that's what the picture does. Now, and just in one that. area, like the rest of the picture is fine. It's just yeah. like a distortion in front of you. It's very strange. I wish we could show the video. I know. I wish we could too. But the noise is interesting oh, as well. And we heard on our tour, 
uh, with me, Akashi, Chris, Dave, and um, Alien Girl, we had some weird noise too, but we think it really? might have been a plane, but it sounded like a World War II era plane, but we couldn't see and a plane. Now it was cloudy. Interesting was too. Cloudy. Yeah. That weird. the people that work on the ranch have recorded sounds deep, deep below, right? Mm -hmm. That sound like machine workings down below the rock. I know. It How sounded like it was coming what? from the mountain, the, like the plane. We were all right. like, even the tour guide stopped. He was like, we were all just like, what is that? But anyways, okay. So let's play this one. Let's so remember, you're not going to see the video. You guys are just going to see a picture and the audio. All right, here yeah. we go. Took care of that. That's the distortion yeah. turning. I'm the same fell. Remember the little thing? At least on the ranch. Right? At least, who else? Russia? Oh, it's so eerie. It's weird, yeah. And they didn't hear this with their ears, right, at the time. Correct. They couldn't hear it. This was in, and also the video. She didn't notice it when she was filming it. Everybody jumped on Ukraine's side and talked talk how bad Russia was. We've been hearing for months. All this conspiracy theory about it almost sounds like a Geiger counter that's pegging. <laughs> the, the COVID uh, stuff that was happening. But we have that part over in sounds weird. Ukraine was already I mean, well known to be one of the most corrupt countries on the There's planet. a bit of a strain, right? Mm -hmm. You can hear it kind of straining. Yeah. It's very bizarre. It's very strange. And then it does happen and, later as well. But it's, it's and at that part where you hear it straining, that's mm -hmm. when the wave actually takes place yeah. visually. And again, on either sides of the frame, it's perfect. And then in the center, you just have this wavy. Yeah, it's like the whole distortion. picture is just like, it's really yeah, strange. It's really it strange. is. But that's a great description. And I'm glad we were able to even show it. Jim, do you have any gut feeling? Do you think the energy of the location could it be a EMP? Is I, was, just... I was, I was, yeah, your brain and not my brain think an awful lot alike. I was thinking uh, e EMP would cause some interference, it would cause the noise, mm. um, and it would also affect, you know, uh, you know our body is, is an electrical plant. So you, mm. you know, you throw in external energy you know to hit you it you know, it could it can affect your vision it can affect your thought process you know your memory or lack of it uh even your your mobility yeah uh, what do you think if there was magnetic ore down there or something you know no. or there is yeah. iridium in the soil on blind frog iridium. there is right. iridium in the soil they have had it tested and there is a high amount of iridium in the soil and we know there was a meteor strike right there because we were collecting those. Um, sure, I oh, I forget slag. what they're called. A slag. You, you, you have some. I, I have a whole bag. Are you kidding? You think I get away, Tim, without getting any? Oh my gosh! I would like, never bring anything the from there. Pick it up. Oh. After what happened to Terry, I don't even wouldn't even want to hold oh. something from there right now. Oh my gosh! Oh, I have that. I have another bag full of rocks. Cool. Yeah, yeah, there's like perfectly um, magnetite. Is that what it's called? Those perfectly round balls that we were finding that were rust colored. And yeah, this one is like one. Well, it's got the dirt on it, but it's one that's literally like broken in half. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. that's a great example. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, all kinds of really cool stuff. By the way, Jim, this is where Dave and I got married on this ranch. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was very How cool. cool. Right in the pool there. The pool, Did you get yeah. in the water? Yeah, we were standing. You haven't seen the picture? All right. I'll I think I, I think I have. I think, think I did, I, but I, I don't think I I just wanted catch. you to show it, yeah. actually. Oh, I just wanted you to show it, you to show it again. Yeah, it's Yeah, awesome. let me, um, hold on, I'll pull it up. But yeah, so the do you want to tell them a little bit about the water while I'm pulling it up? Yeah, absolutely. So it's supposed to have healing powers, right? And um, you may know a little bit more about this than me because a lot of the narrative that I was getting was some of the negativity or mm -hmm. let's not call it negative, but like just some of the stuff that is considered a little darker mm -hmm. simply because that is what um, my partner up there, he, when he went up with me, yeah. he uh, experienced something that was a little bit hard for him to, to get through. I personally had a glorious time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was completely clueless, dancing on my tiptoes, enjoying the plateaus and taking photos and film and had um, no negative experience whatsoever. Um, 
you know, no elevation sickness. I felt great. And here was, you know, my buddy who's from the area for 30 years and just oh. suffering. It was yeah. bizarre to, to take. Uh, what, what's party the, what's to... the altitude there? It's, oh, it's, it's higher. I can't remember. 1300, what it is. Like, yeah. 13, 1600 feet like above that. sea level, yeah. somewhere in that neighborhood. So let's see. I yeah. found, hold on a second. Um, all right. So this is the, um, the pond. And anybody cool. who's seen the show, so this is me, Akashi, Chris, Yay. and William Girl Amy. Um, so this is the pond. And yeah, we all did get into it. We got into it first. And then Dave and I were <laughs> very impromptu got married standing in the water of all things. Um, so and, this, it, and it, yeah, and it looks kind of green and stuff, but it's actually really clear and really nice. Yeah. yeah. And there's a cave system underneath it. Um in the show, the, it started out, they were looking for Aztec gold to see if the Aztecs... And they, they did find something weird within the cave system. They had to go diving yeah, into did. it. Um, sure and Akashi Chris was very upset with the fact that Chad had to like breathe from a tube, uh, from a hose. <laughs> it was <laughs> used. Tank. It was a used hose, too. A used, yeah. Oh, my gosh. When yeah. she told that story at the dinner yeah. table, we had got to sit with Dwayne, who is the owner of the ranch. And he was just cracking up because Chris was doing an yeah. impersonation of him. He goes, you don't even know the worst of it. It was a used hose. It wasn't yeah. even a brand new hose. Like <laughs> Such a great group of people. I must yeah. say that was an amazing uh, symposium. It was. it was my I first. I'd never been in public on, to an event like that before. And that group was right on par i mean like right on money a yeah. great time like-minded people great information mm -hmm. and science-based everyone was it wasn't the woo which oh, i was kind I of expecting <laughs> i know you do i'm i'm the other side of the coin though i was I so thrilled it was just a bunch of people looking for data and talking about yeah. like the stuff that you could wrap your hands around like that really gets me interested yes so this, no. uh, to add a little woo in, because I can. Um, Please. <laughs> so this is from Dinosaur National Monument. Um, Dave, Chris, and I, yeah. after the symposium was done, we went out there. And these are some of the petroglyphs that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and this, actually, I like this picture because it shows the three different representations of beings. There's This is much, much bigger. It's an alcove um, and has a lot more than this. But um, there's three different. So you got this this dude here with the weird horn thingies, right? This one that is smaller, and all of these guys were smaller than any of these types of um, these renditions of a being. Um, and they had this yeah. head, this triangular body. Um, this red you can see is still some of the the paint that's on there. But this guy, okay, hold on, I've got. I don't know if we can see your cursor. I've got. But... Oh right, oh because I'm doing it on this one. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I'm getting so excited. Okay. Hold on, yeah. I have a close-up of him. I'll show you. Um, he looks like a gray. Like, let's just be straight up. This yep. looks like a gray alien. Absolutely. Jim How many Scott. fingers does he have there? He has six fingers. Mm. Interesting. What do you think, Jim? It's I mean, there's, there's, there's way too many of these from all over around the world to say that, well, someone was was uh, eating magic mushrooms or peyote or uh, same thing, you know, and or some real, you know, some real toxic weed, literally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's not the case. But right. yeah, they're going back. We're going back thousands of years. You're seeing these things. I mean, they you know they've tested them and they you know four thousand BC and and stuff like that. So it's the descriptions. You know, if you're looking, if you're looking at it for grays, those descriptions are seen all over the planet. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, kind of, you know, it's so it, it, it either someone, someone has affected everybody's imagination over the last uh, couple hundred thousand years and, and embedded this design in their, in someone's brain. Mm. It's something it's, this is up there because they saw something that looked like that. Yeah. yeah. That's but why they, it's there. Yeah. Cause the Even stereotype that we think of as an alien, which is a gray, didn't come about until the fifties. So this was certainly much older than that. Now we don't have an exact date on it because obviously it's rock and we can't like carbonate the rock itself, but they're, they're speculating that it is 
they call it archaic because they don't have a term for the people that came before the native people that they think because this for whatever reason they felt was older and i have a book and i can't remember why it's <laughs> on at this particular second um so there there was no uh like social idea of a gray back then that's a that is a modern concept that came about in the 50s so there's no way right. that we can say this was socially influenced and this was their version of photographs this mm -hmm. was their data this was their history they left these here as information for all of the people that will come after them this was their life right and so if they experience something because we're seeing them depicting hunting a lot of very regular day, everyday mundane things. And then next to it, we see this. Why would they suddenly it's, depart it's, from reality and start drawing something that they weren't seeing? They it's were like seeing a, it's it. like a Facebook posting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It literally is. <laughs> yeah, this this I mean, one this one can't be taken down because of you know fail you you violated right, community standards. Non compliant. <laughs> yeah. Non compliant artwork. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But I, I think that that's exactly it. In my in my opinion, I think historians agree that they were really drawing what they were seeing in their reg regular everyday life. Mm -hmm. I I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um I'm trying to see if I can move let's see oh, okay here we go here's the side by side can you guys see that did it switch yep. on yeah okay yeah. and these are massive too right like eight foot they seven are feet. yeah let me show you i have a picture of um chris right near it oh if this thing's in the way um okay well there's me and chris well that's actually hold on ignore that it's in the background oh it's just there. adding to it now okay interesting uh nope Okay, there's Chris standing right near it. So one, okay. it's high up. So she's standing right, she's kind of down in the crotchetal region of this guy right here <laughs> when she's holding yeah. her hand up. So it's high and the and the ground is down, you know, you can see where she's at. So this guy's right. up higher and there were ones that were even higher than this um, that we were looking at. <laughs> and there's a reason that they're placed certain ways. I mean, we yeah. know that we've seen the spirals and that they're very specific as to the detail and what they're trying to uh, convey. So everything is put here for a reason. These rocks mm -hmm. were sacred to them for a reason. They decided yeah. to place their artwork here for a reason, you know? And so for us to just glaze past it as just being something that was created um, isn't fair. And I think, you know, we're selling them short as to this is their way that they were leaving a history of what the people were actually seeing yeah right. it's amazing stuff it really is and it was so cool to see it in person too i think that it, the impact really does hit home when you're looking at it face to face because mm -hmm. you're like yeah i get what these people are seeing out here and experiencing and with the energy and things like that um and again i don't want to discourage anyone from going like it is it is an energy it's not mm -hmm. good or bad I think it's the sort of thing like if you go there with baggage, that place makes you deal with it. Yeah. If that makes any sense. It kind of seems like, you know, if you've got something truth, dark in your yeah, a dark truth in your detector. Heart, yeah, it yeah. just brings it out. It's like yeah. you need to deal with this right now. Yeah, that's exactly it. And that's not bad. It might yeah. feel bad, but after it's very cleansing, right? And so a lot of mm -hmm. what that is up there is cleansing energy, mm -hmm. I guess, quote unquote, according to people that are in the know. Yeah. So you want to see something, and this is nothing like um, uh, paranormal or supernatural or weird. It just was a really cool picture. So alien girl, Amy, she gave us these two beautiful quartz crystals as a wedding present. Uh, and they had oh, a wonderful cool. story behind them. They were her parents. Her parents had been married for, I can't remember, I think she said 40 years. Um, and they collected oh. these crystals and they had them and they had given them to her and she gifted them to us. And cool. so I wanted to take a picture that I was going to like show her and I taken them out to the petroglyphs because I wanted to put them in the sun, charge them in front of the petroglyphs just because I really liked, we'd already been out cool. there once and I really liked it. Um, yeah, but look at how the picture turned out. It's actually really kind of cool. I was like, what? Did that just happen? This is amazing. Because it was just the sunlight coming in Ooh. and it was like right at the very like point. Whoa. You could Did see you know that there. that was happening when you took that? Yeah, I could see it. <laughs> I could see That's it in the camera. So I was like, cool. yes. <laughs> I took a bunch That's of That's an amazing.
and capture. Look at the beauty. Right? That is and just a great. Of, the little guys behind him. Only in the Uinta Basin would you get a shot like that. I mean, that's just cool. It's amazing. And these are cool. big crystals. Like you could hold each in one like hand. Um, that's amazing. They're big crystals. Wow. Yeah. It was really, I know I was like, uh, the, like the timing just was like spot on because I don't know if at another time during the day, the sun would have been right at that spot. But yeah. It yeah. It's crazy. And I mean, you can see dinosaurs of all shapes and sizes there as well. Yeah. Like everything is there. And to think that that was all underwater at one point is yeah. also a mind blower to know how high in it is elevated. And yet it was underwater. It's yeah. kind of hard to wrap your head around. Yeah. Like Enzo's comment. That's yeah. right. The lowest arc rays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enzo gets it. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's now, 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 along along some of those same lines, uh, COVID, you know, the COVID lockdowns, you know, put, you know, screwed things up. Yeah. But I have a a dear friend, Stuart Brown. He uh, was with Popular Science for years. He did the article in Area Fifty One that six million people saw. Wow. Yeah. Uh, highest distribution, largest distribution ever for popular science, uh, hmm. March 94. But uh, Stuart has a dear friend who is a retired, I think either Navajo or Apache Supreme Court Justice. Hmm. And uh, he was, uh, William was uh, tasked to be the chief law enforcement officer at the Dosi Pueblo in Northern New Mexico. And he said that uh, he speaks both Apache and Navajo. And he has talked, uh, at my request, he has talked to some of the elders. Now, these people have, you know, this, this group of uh, uh, Native Americans have, have most, of the, most of the occupants and residents of the Dulce Pueblo have never been outside the Pueblo. They don't speak wow. English. They speak the yeah. native tongue. Uh, those that have been, you know, gone off the reservation, come back in, are you know, are fluent in English. But you know, his buddy William speaks uh, fluent Navajo and uh, and Apache. He's talked with some of the elders. They have agreed to sit down on a recorded session with with uh, William, given the uh, translation, to talk about. What has you know, what their elders have talked about as far as things supernatural beings and things that you know came down from the sky, uh, things that opened up. It also has a uh, unobstructed view of the main part of the Dulce facility, military facility, and there's nothing they can do to stop you because it's on it's on Indian land, and they yeah. have no and you know they have no jurisdiction there. Right. So, you know, be, you know, because of COVID, that is, you know, we had something planned for you know early 2020, and of course, we we all know what happened with 2020. And that used oh, to be a right. perfect. That used to be a perfect monic, you know, moniker where you would say, well, you know, this is this is going to be 2020. In other words, it's going to be really tough <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. definition changed completely. Yeah. It sure did. Yeah. Sure so did. I'm I'm hoping. I don't know if it'll happen this year. Maybe this fall. Uh, That's great. And there's also a crash site that, uh, again, because of COVID, everything has gotten locked up. But there was a, there was something that crashed in a wilderness area right along the Arizona-New Mexico border. Hmm. Uh, it was tracked on radar going 3,000 miles an hour when it hit the ground. Wow. When and, was this? Uh, September of 2015. Oh wow! It's near it's near Green Greenwood, no Glenwood, New Mexico. I talked to the fire marshal there, and he said uh, about a it's about six months after. And he said, "Oh yeah," they said there there were semis going in there. He said there were more white vans filled with guys that you can think shake a stick at. We had earth moving equipment, huh. and they were there. They were in they were in the area for. Uh, for three days. And when they came out, they headed south. They didn't head north towards Kirkland. Uh, they headed south. 
And uh, wh whatever was on the flight flatbed wasn't very big. Of course, you, you hit the Jim, ground. And don't you wonder with all of those bodies and all those vehicles that none of the information gets out? How does it get locked up so tight? Is it all NDAs? Is it all loyal military personnel? Why don't right. we hear about this stuff or get well, any uh, photographs or? A, a good example, and it, it's it's and it's my love. It's the Blackbird. The CIA version of the Blackbird flew from uh, from sixty two to uh, the last flight was June of sixty eight. So you have six years of it flying. You had a lot of people involved in the production and building of the A twelve Blackbird. You have uh, you know support personnel at Area fifty one, you know cooks, janitors, and whatever. That program was canceled for 20 years before before the word ever got down. Yeah, that A-12s were re a real airplane, and they were they were you know, developed uh, and paid for by the Central Intelligence Agency. Right. 20, 20 years the program had come to an end before they finally admitted the existence. When your life, when your livelihood uh, is is secured because you have a Q clearance or a, an above top secret clearance. And that is, that is your, uh, your area of, of, of passion. That's, you know, that's the only thing you've ever done without that security clearance. You can't get a job as a garbage man at area 51. Hmm. So right. the thing that keeps everybody from talking is not, they're not going to prosecute you. Because that, that would, you know, a trial would be made public hmm. one way or the other. There would be public transcripts of a trial. There would be appeals right. and stuff like that. If you violate the security, all they do is pull your clearance. Now, hmm. if your entire life has revolved working in, in the uh, black community, not African-American black, I'm talking about top secret black and that's and that's your livelihood that's a real strong incentive to keep quiet you right. know i've i've had i've had guys that a buddy of mine had 37 years at the skunk works he sat down and i asked him once i said I said foxy he said do you believe in ufos he said oh absolutely positively they do exist so we have things that makes you know, that makes steven spielberg uh envious um, yeah, but he said that you know the main the main thing that keeps everybody from saying anything is the fact that they're 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 paid well, and their livelihood is a hundred percent in a classified environment. They can't even tell their lives. One this gets had, a little controversial, but do you think that they use even like mind control potentially on people that have high clearances when they leave? Or Do you think there's like any way to delete memories? Do you think that's going on? I know it's pretty conspiratorial, what? but that's all of my experiences, Tim. You uh, and I have to talk. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, Bob Bob Lazar said that when you when you got to S four, they gave you something, uh, and same when you left. And I think it's one of the reasons he went public. I don't know. But I was supposed to go up and visit him after I was at Beale. I gave a presentation on the Blackbird at, at Beale Air Force Base, which is kind of ironic. And I said, well, that's where it lived right. for 25 years. But then I realized it had been 30 years or 32 years since it left. And right. I was I was going to go visit Bob. And I, I drive a car with really, really wide tires. I have a <laughs> Grand Sport Corvette. That's my daily driver. Nice. And where where I was going, where you know where Bob lives, I had to go. It was it was snowing. This is in you know in April, and I just and I had to uh, I just had I had to cancel it. I had to cancel the trip, and it was and I was really up, I wasn't happy about it. But there's no there's no way I'm going to be driving through the mountains when there's any chance of any snow, even even on a damp road. If it hasn't rained in a while and I get I goose it a little hard. I mean, my my rear tires are 13 inches wide on the tread, and it just breaks loose. I mean, it's just yeah. so uh, I am gonna I am some probably this fall or probably in, maybe in August when I uh, go on my road trip, assuming there will be gas available. Uh, <laughs> It'll be available. It'll just cost you. Yeah, 10 bucks a gallon. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I, I get 24 miles to the gallon on my Corvette, which is pretty good for a 430 Sweet. horsepower thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's, well, there's no wind resistance. Right. I mean, and I lose it in parking lots. I know what that's about. It. Yeah, yeah. I have no wind resistance, too. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to go from here to Albuquerque through Denver. I want to go. I want to go to the uh, museum uh, in the you know the uh, museum of the Rockies or the Aviation Museum of the Rockies there at the old Lowry Air Force Base. Yeah. I was stationed there for two years, cool. and last time I was at Lowry was in the late seventies. So it's you know it's it doesn't exist anymore. And what people right. aren't aware of who longtime Denver residents is on the southeast corner of what used to be Lowry Air Force Base were seventy two. 10 megaton hydrogen bombs. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I got it. In the 70s. In, the uh, 80s. in the 60s, they were there. And, and they oh. had up through, the, up through the early 70s. They had the 451st Strategic Missile Wing, which were Titan ones. And they just had one big gigantic uh, warhead. Oh but they, they stored the warheads for other, uh, other bases. But if again the uh, you know the, the local residents of and and that part of the Denver area just south of the base is very exclusive neighborhood and I don't think they realized that they had enough nuclear warheads there to literally you know create a huge you know, a, a a huge canyon if they were to go off. Mm. Uh, Brasselhoff has a question. Do you know anything about the silent or stealth helicopters either of the last 20 years or now? Yeah, there's 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 two versions. One of them is a uh, it's a Hughes. I mean, it's McDonnell Douglas now. Uh, Loach. It's the uh, Bumblebee, they call it. It's the H6 or U86. It's the uh, they have it in uh, Magnum PI. Those guys use it. <laughs> and uh, they have a no tail rotor type and they use a wide bladed five bladed propeller. And the group that flies them are the 160th special, I think a special activity squadron, uh, for the army. And I had a buddy of mine who was on a, uh, floating Island in the middle of the Persian Gulf. Uh, it was a helicopter you know, base, but it was an oil rig. They platform that they modified to be a, a, almost like an Island. Yeah. And they can they can move it, but he was he was out there. He was out having a cigarette at night, and he he felt a a, a downdraft, but not a not a heavy one, but you know just wind sort of. You can tell it's coming down on him. And he looked up, and about thirty or forty feet above him was one of these you know one of these uh, H you know H six loaches. Is that said, quiet? It's that he said. It's that quiet. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah, and huh. and and that was during that was late eighties to early nineties. Huh. Now, when they when they got Bin Laden and they uh, they crashed their uh, stealth helicopter, that probably that had you know similar technologies as far as slow turning wide cord uh, blades. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you get you get some of your uh, your like a Huey. You know, Huey has you know, two blades. I guess the uh, AH, uh, I went. And my mind just went blank. Yeah, the, the regular, the regular, the regular. What was that? Sorry, that was me. Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> microphone. Oh my God! You got we just owned. Uh, we just been invaded. Oh yeah, there are other shots are outside. Yeah. I was trying to be cool, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but yeah, but a uh, a, a Huey, an H one or uh, AH one a. Uh, uh, Cobra, you know, they have two bladed. And then when they went to the W and to the X, they, you know, they went to the four bladed to quite, to make them quieter. Yeah. So they just go yeah. to a wide cord. Now they had the uh, Comanche that uh, uh, Sikorsky was working on. It was canceled and that was supposed to be a low observable, but they, uh, they kept getting the uh, going over budget and not meeting their technical challenges. Yeah. So they, you know, there's there's two that I know of, but the the one that was operational, and I actually saw them. They were they had six of them in in Hangar One at McCord. Uh, I was in there working on a uh, uh, PBY Catalina, 
uh, it was for their museum there. I was I was doing uh, 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 ticket making up some some time in my in my unit, and I was uh, you know I was there working on uh, the uh, Cat you know, the uh, Catalina, and there were there was six of these helicopters in there, and I went over to talk to the guys. I said, well, I can't tell you much about them. We're just but we're with the one the one sixtieth. Things are flat black, and the serial numbers, which you have to have, uh, even in a war zone, was a little bit, probably two shades different color, flat black. So the only way you can see it is you got the light just right. You can see what what the serial number was. Other than yeah. that, you couldn't see it. Wow. Yeah. And it it had it had uh, uh, platforms on the skids. So the guys could you know, stand. You can, your special, your special uh, warfare guys could stand on that. So when they land, they can you know they're out immediately. Yeah, but it was just really, really fascinating. And it's just uh, yeah, it's, it's very. I mean, it's and they have that. Uh, well, I know about it. I know about Ever Evergreen Aviation Museum. Uh, Please do tell. I've been there a few times myself. Yeah. And there's um there's um, I mean a rumor that there's s tunnels below yeah i haven't so, heard i haven't heard that there i've heard it okay. tunnels everywhere else but not not yeah. in evergreen yeah. uh <laughs> dick smith uh was under contract with the central intelligence agency the evergreen uh, evergreen airlines or aviation uh, that was sort of that and southern air transport were the the new names of uh, air america and uh, you no, know, I've been I've been there there three or four times, um, and I get I guess I guess the spruce goose uh, has been invaded by termites. Yeah, I heard that too. They were restoring because of that, and it is held there. And um, there's a really great water park attached. Well, yes, in the, and my kids love that. So <laughs> we're we, we always go through, there. But you go you out, you go out of a seven forty seven, don't you? You sure do. Yeah. yeah you water sure. slide out of a 747. It's such That's a cool. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. a great water park. Well, they, um, because, because the thing was a 501 C three organization and they did stuff that was not allowed under a 50 C three C three, uh, nonprofit. They got their right. fanny in some real deep, uh, uh, tax trouble and they've, they've sold off, uh, a, a fair part of their collection that they, yeah. you know, that they, yeah. that they owned and they're, uh, but there's, you know, there's activity out of Marana at Pinal air park, you know, you know, about 15, 18 miles from here. Uh, and they have an army aviation unit out there. So I could get on the facility, but it's, it's just not convenient. And I've, you know, there's days. There's days. You know, being I'm retired. I've been retired since 2013. It's I can't believe it's been nine years. I've been unemployed. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but do you but, do you think there's any connection there um, with Evergreen Aviation and some of the um, secretive operations by the CIA and so? Oh, absolutely, that? absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. I now, guess that's kind of along the lines of what Terry's asking there. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're uh, evergreen. Evergreen was was the you know the cousin or the illegitimate uh, uh, son of Air America. And uh, my you know my friend you know Lear he flew for Continental Air Service for for fourteen years. That was a division. That was a subsidiary of Air America. And that was an interesting operation. And it's, yeah. it's it's a shame that, that that John Lear's no longer with us because he had some stories. He had some, you know, he, he was he was he's a one of a kind. And yeah. I, do you think you'll be able to write some of them down? No, he's dead. He just your, he passed. No, away. no, but I'm saying you yeah. know the stories, right? Because you were friends. You should um, write them down as a as a writer. Yeah, yeah. You got to share them with the world. Yeah, I should. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the you know the the one thing I've been as far as, far as just writing a, a a history. My uh, my ex wife threw all of them away, but I had about four hundred three by five cards in chronological order, of all the crazy stuff I did as a kid and a young adult, 
Hmm. Naming, naming names. All oh my gosh! <laughs> and I had, you know, I had the time. I had the event. I, who was there? What we did? Wow. Um, That's. Incredible. I mean, Doug, Doug Malone and I blew up a bridge up near Stevens Creek Reservoir. Uh, Casually, just mentions that. <laughs> yeah, public, we were, public here with us, Lynn. We were, we were eleven or twelve no years deal. old, and uh, early start at bridge blowing. Wow. Yeah, and Jim. You're blowing and, my mind. And he had, he had uh, about a week earlier, he had uh, not broken into it because it wasn't really padlocked. It was locked, but it wasn't locked that good. Locks keep honest, people honest. But it, he was, right. uh, Kaiser Permanetti had uh, a site where they were, you know, blowing up rock, you know, blowing up stuff to make uh, cement. And the, uh, you know, he went in there and he got, he got actually four sticks of dynamite and blasting caps. Oh my God. In the wrong hands, and we're oh ten, we're ten and twelve ten. year old kids. Oh my, oh my gosh! You blew up and the bridge. So we blew up the bridge, <laughs> but Alan Holmes and I took no uh, took two of the uh, sticks of dynamite, and Stevens not that not that far from his from his house. There was a vacant lot, and then it was a, it dropped down about forty feet to Stevens Creek. And we used to have a swimming hole there. And this this year was, you know, it wasn't running, it wasn't very deep. So we said, we have to dam this thing up. <laughs> and Alan said, well, you know, said, you know, Doug still has some dynamite left over, you know, from you know, from Kaiser Permanetti. <laughs> so we watch used to watch industry on parade. So we got a, a piece of uh, aluminum conduit. We dug a, a hole about six or eight feet into the base Don't of this. Tell us this. how you did it. <laughs> You're telling <laughs> us how you did it. Statue of limitations. And I would deny it. Okay. I just, uh, he just knows every detail. Oh, we, I love it. Jim, we, it's we, so we blew this, we blew this thing up. And I look back out. That was somebody's lot. I mean, it was, oh you know, it was almost waterfront, but we blew it up and this thing made a dam and it got in, you know, about 15 or 20 feet deep. Wow. Uh, by the end of summer, and that was between uh, this and being near and, Element One Fifteen. I don't. And we're my mom best never. Friends. This hey, is awesome. When I was eleven, Alan Holmes, Doug Malone, <laughs> one other kid, and myself, we borrowed a train that had been sitting on a siding in Mountain View. Borrowed That's a one train. Day. You, you yeah, can't yeah. steal one. You can't steal one. And it was a weekend. Yeah, where are you going to take it? <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a weekend, and the engines running. It was about a, eight or ten cars. They left Some, the keys around Jim Goodall. They should have known better. They it should have never. It, it wasn't locked. Doug said. <sighs> Doug said, "Hey," said the cab is open. Take and it. They, it. And they apparently they they were lazy or didn't lock switches back then because they didn't have a lot of people like <laughs> they me didn't around. See you guys coming, Jim. They had so we, no idea. We got onto the main line, and there in Mountain View, you have two sets of tracks. You have northbound and southbound. So we we knew what the southbound lane was. So we took oh it down you know, uh, 14 miles into San Jose. But when we went through when we went through Sunnyvale, it's a five mile an hour zone. We're doing about 50 blasting the horn the whole way. We get we get oh to San Jose, we get to San Jose, and this is like this is like 1955 56 time frame. We get to we get to San Jose. You know we uh, we get off. You know we stop the train. We put it on a side. Let siding. the passengers out. Yeah, and we played around, and all of a sudden it's, it's starting to get dark. And we said, "Hey, we got to get we got to get back home before curfew." So we knew we knew we knew there was a, there was a freight that went up uh, left about nine o'clock at night because it got through Mountain View about uh, I get about nine twenty, and there was an area they had an ice plant that we just, we knew where to jump off at. We jumped off, and it's now after curfew. And we were, and back then, and it was that was something you were really concerned about. So we all smoked. So uh, we, we're at the train. We're, we're at the train station, and you know, we didn't have any money, and we we didn't have any cigarettes. But we got the cigarette machine. We took it. We got it. Put it upside down and shook it. We got about ten mm -hmm. or fifteen packs of cigarettes, maybe ten dollars <laughs> worth of quarters. <laughs> And we're uh, they shook it like yeah. a giant piggy bank. Yeah. So we're thinking, so okay, there's there's four of there's now there's, there's there's only three of us. There's three of us that said how you know how we're gonna get all the way home without getting without getting spotted. 
So there was a there was a blue and white step van right next to the uh, train station that would our our bikes fit right in it, and just because it said United States Postal Service on it, <laughs> and it was real easy to hot wire. Oh, and we, real and, easy. And, and we stopped. We stopped about uh, you know about two blocks from from Rusty's house. One of the guys that was with us. How old were you at this point? At, in your 11, new engineer, 11, 11 year 12, old engineer, 11 or smoking 12. cigarettes and <laughs> yeah, yeah, hot wiring. I mean, yeah. I like that the did concern not was know. curfew and, and not I didn't, train, not the postal, still cared about the curfew. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about because mom uh, and dad uh, about did they ever find the train. <laughs> But about three weeks later, we're, at, we're in the cafeteria for lunch, and this one kid was talking. I overheard him. And he said, his dad worked for Southern Pacific. He says, it says the weirdest thing happened. My dad said they, they, they lost a train with, a, with a eight or ten cars on it. And they couldn't figure out what in the hell happened to it. It wasn't on any of their schedules or whatever it is. And they found it on some siding in San Jose. They don't know how in the hell they got there. I mean, everything was intact. Nothing was damaged. That was us. You're yeah, like Jimmy Goodall. Oh yeah. my gosh. That, that, that's why I'm, I'm. That's why I'm surprised I made it to 77 years. I am too now, knowing that. Yeah. Wow. So that's wow. You guys had cojones. Yeah. No, we had fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Another, yeah, another thing, fun. of course, blowing you know, up bridges. Yeah, the space Hanging thing. Out. Yeah, the space Train. thing was was yeah. was getting real big. My dad was head of engineering Train. at Philco Ford Western Development Laboratories, which is on San Antonio and Bayshore, and they had uh, tracking antennas used for satellite tracking. This is you know something. This was something new in 1960, and there was a uh, a target on top of Black Mountain up in the, the Coast Mountains. They would aim the radar towards it, and they would calibrate the radar. We're up there with our bicycles, and they said, "Gee, I wonder what happened if I if we crank this crank." Of course, it's moving. It's moving the, the reflector. <laughs> My dad came home from from work. Then Monday he says, "I don't know what the hell happened. We're trying to calibrate this uh, one antenna, and all of a sudden we're not getting any signal back at all." <laughs> and so they had to send some guys out there, and they realized that oh, someone had gone in and. Little Jimmy uh, Goodall. Yeah. Oh, man. You had your uh, hands I mean, on everything. I had 400 <laughs> card, cards listing the time, names. the place, and the oh names. God. That's gold. Worth its weight in gold right now. And, and my ex threw it all away. Oh. I'm such a fan. Jim, I didn't think this was the conversation I was going to have tonight at all. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm sure Lynn didn't this either, but... Been- this is I great. Just expect the unexpected at this point, Jim. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I love I, it. I've done a lot of fun things, and and I yeah, and I have good I for have you. Been, I've been truly blessed with uh, everything I've I've done. A life uh, of adventure, and you yeah. came out a hero. You're also an American hero, sir. Let's not um, forget that all of your downgrades as a child were washed <laughs> away with your heroism serving your country. In my personal opinion, I completely feel that way so i'm during, sure your during, audience will be. during the same early to mid 1950s uh yeah it's our next yeah. show so, yeah. I jinx and <laughs> little, little jimmy yeah. goodall <laughs> i love it that's a show title and so well done yeah yeah no i've, I've had a fun that. time and and that's i've great. always i have always colored outside the lines and played outside the box that's that's it's good and, advice and yeah. what my my TI and basic training told me he said, "Good, all you have everything going for you, but your mouth," and that gets me <laughs> in a lot of trouble too. Even today, I mean, <laughs> you're telling us everything. You oh no, I'm not. Beans. No, I'm not. There's a lot I haven't. Uh, <laughs> I, say, as far as my as, as far as my life is concerned, I don't know if you know. I don't see the X Love rating it. up in the very top up here. And so, <laughs> and so, a disclaimer: We did have a disclaimer at the beginning of the show. So yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So. No, I've done a lot of fun things. I've been I've been That's to all great. fifty states. I've been to every province and territory in Canada, including the Maritimes, uh, Yukon Territory, Northwest Territory, every country in Central America and South America, except I haven't been to Belize, and I haven't been to the the uh, French Guiana, the three above uh, Venezuela. 
Uh, and I have been to Uruguay, Uruguay or Paraguay, but I've been to the rest. I did embassy resupply, uh, you know, with with the, yeah. uh, the Air Force and the Air Guard, uh, and that's what that's why I got through all Central America. See the but, world, yeah. But you know, for 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 business, uh, you know, I've been to, I've been all over Canada and all fifty states. Lived in stationed in Alaska. Lived in Hawaii. I even lived in Washington D.C. Yeah, so yeah. That was That's funny. Great. That was funny. That's but, incredible. Thank you well, so much for Tim, sharing tonight. Tim, yeah. I, I have, uh, and thank you for sharing, you know, your adventures there in Bainbridge yeah. and, and elsewhere. Uh, it's a real delight. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to go to Seattle this summer. I may, which means I will come I'll, down, I'll come down I five if I if I yeah. go that way. That's the only way to go. I five. Oh, I hate I hate I five though. I hate I five. I've, I've been from the beginning of it to the end of it. I've gone from yeah, man. Me too. Me San, too. San Ysidro to uh, the Peace Arch uh, there in Blaine. That's right. And I've covered of the fifty four thousand miles of interstate highway. I've driven over fifty thousand miles of them. Wow. I took a map one day. It was, a, it was a Raman now app. I said, okay, I got a magic marker. I'm going to start marking the, the freeways have been on. And I, other than some new ones on the East Coast, I've been to all of them. <laughs> or down That's all incredibly of them. cool. Yeah, it's just fun. And I, yeah. And I love going it's on life's road trips. an adventure. I love going on road trips. So, yeah. so well, that's what awesome. I do. Tim, but, before we go, because I know it's getting late, but Tim has a new YouTube channel, which is very exciting. I do have the, the do. link in the description. You want to tell everybody about that? Great. What's sure. Um, it's, it's Anonymous Rex, and it's just um, my online handle turned into a show. And um, I'm going to be doing, I believe, Sundays. Um, it's definitely flexible. I don't want to step on toes or anyone else's showtime. So I'm just going to try and slide in there with um, an hour show couple hours show here and the, here and there um try and do sundays and i'll be bringing video and lots of hot topics nice. so yeah. and if if you want me on i can talk about my youth thank okay. you yes <laughs> please <laughs> thank you i would love and be honored to have you on thank no, you for that all right now it would be yeah, it's awesome I, i'm just a guy who's been around for a long time i'm nobody special. i love it yeah, yes, that's who I have on my show. Guys that have been in, and girls that have been around doing stuff. That's perfect. Yeah, yep. I mean, no, I, I, love mean, it. I'd be, I'd be, I would be more than happy to do that. Thank you. That's so. great. And Lynn, I hope you'll be there too. Anytime. At some point. Anytime. That's great. Yeah. That's great. I, I look forward to it. Thank you again, guys, for having me on tonight. It's been so. Well, it's much been fun. fun. I I always yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, uh, Lynn said, well, I remember last time, so we'll, let's keep it to an hour. I'm not feeling good. And an hour and 20, you know, two hours and 20 minutes later, I said, no, I, I <laughs> think we made it past in the hour you were talking about. It just, yeah. the time just flies. It mm. does. It does. It's a great topic. I mean, this topic yeah. tells itself, you know, yeah. it's a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people, you know, people, I said, would you take notes? I said, no, I got it all up here. I keep it up here with my ass. You know? so. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> that is great. Yeah. I've been, I've been blessed with a really good memory. So I'm, mm. that part is great. That part is great. And thank you so, for sharing your story with us, Tim. That was amazing to hear. Yes. My pleasure. So my pleasure. I'm here anytime. If any of your audience or yourselves have questions or any you know, follow up. I'm totally available. Absolutely. Although I'm sure we will have to have you on again. Love to. Jim is Love doing to. his disappearing act. No, no I was I writing. Every time you've been down, you disappear. He's, he's writing down some notes. He's yep. taking a note. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. So I can add to my pile of notes. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So there you go. I, I've been asked to go to Roswell with uh, Michael Schratt. He's uh, heading out there on Wednesday. Excellent. And uh, I, I think I'm going to pass on it because uh, on the 22nd, I have to go to Minnesota for five days, four days. Mm -hmm. My grandson, my middle, yeah, my middle grandson, uh, the juvenile delinquent, is taken after his grandfather. <laughs> and, we were, he, and we shared the same birthday. So okay. that's the frightening part. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to be out in the, I'm going to be out in Denver for a MUFON symposium the 6th through the 11th and then Vegas for a couple of days. So I'm going to try and get out to area 51 just to go film and check it out and uh, maybe meet with some 
insiders from there. Mm. Yeah. And so now, details uh, to follow. We'll see. When you uh when you're when you're ready to go, uh give me a buzz. I can tell you I will where to go, what to do, what not. I'm writing to do. down a note here. Call Jim before <laughs> I go to Area 51. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. <laughs> well they I mean I was in in, in, no, in November I was uh there were a couple of guys were we're in Tipico Valley, which is you know, the east, you know, east side. And we're heading yeah. up towards the one of the mines on the, the top of uh, the, the Groom Range. And they've moved the security uh, signs a mile or so outside of their restricted area. They don't have jurisdiction. And, and, and the, the, the signs are there to uh, step one, steal a train. Okay. Uh, I love it. Enzo's so on the money with these jokes. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And it's and it's uh, we didn't we didn't want to push the issue. The truck wasn't mine. It was a friend of mine named Dale, and you know he only he paid about ninety five thousand dollars for the truck. He, oh. you know, he he didn't want it to get it uh, impounded, so we didn't right. do it. But I, I can I can tell you where to go uh, if you want to go low observable, uh, yeah. both at Tonopah Test Range and at Area Fifty One. Low observable. I like that you slid oh, yeah. that in because yeah. that is key. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So uh, you'll you'll have a good time. But the, the awesome. But, uh, you go out. You go out there. Don't go alone. You know, have at least right. one person with you, and make sure you have a lot of water. Enough water. You think you have enough, and then double it. Good advice. And and, a, and a, a good first aid kit. But I'll tell you, you know, where to go and and you know how to you know how to, you know sneak around and whatever. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. I and you'll probably that. and you'll probably you'll probably be followed by a white pickup truck in some of the areas. And that's those okay. are just those are the base security people. They have no jurisdiction if they're the Wackenhut security or if they're the uh, Air Force security, they have no jurisdiction outside of Area 51. Right. Well, I was I was there for the Storm Area 51 event that really didn't happen. And someone said, well, how are they going to stop 2 million people? Yeah, just shoot the, the guy up front. <laughs> what do you turn around and run the other <laughs> yeah. way? Uh, there were more security so people. There were more military and civilian security people there than there were participants. Yeah. Right. But one, right. one, of, one, of the, one of the things that came back, they, uh, they had the governor of Nevada had the National Guard on alert, this, you know, this, uh, the military police group, because... The security people within Area 51, including the contract security and Air Force security, have no jurisdiction outside of the fence line. Right. So, so it would be uh, under local police if anything yeah, went so wrong on the outside. So, so it would be the sheriff, it would know, be the U.S. Marshals or whatever. But uh, other people said, well, how in the hell are they going to stop all these people? And I said, the word came down from the Pentagon, and I have this from the horse's mouth, that Department of Defense said – no one, absolutely no one, will be allowed to penetrate the perimeter of Area 51, period. And it was spelled out, period. <laughs> and what they did, they brought in the non-lethal, <clears throat> losing my voice, the non-lethal uh, crowd control equipment, both the right. microwave <clears throat> second. and the sonic. The sonic one is horrible. They call, they call it the brown sound. It hits, <laughs> yeah. it, it hits you and your bowels evacuate. <clears throat> And your level of enthusiasm drops dramatically from a pants full of poop. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I it's love hard. that you termed it that way. That is yeah. your level of enthusiasm drops. <laughs> yeah. That is yeah. the understatement of the hour. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Tim, it's been, it's been fun. Um, it sure has. I, friend me on Facebook. If you, if you, Unless you're I don't not really on it. do social, I don't do anything social media. I'm so lame. Um, <laughs> but I do texting and email. That's about okay, it. and that's and that's Let's what that. I do. Um, cool. I can I give want... him your info if you want, Tim or Jim. Perfect. Please yeah. do. Yeah, I don't. Please. I don't want. I don't want to give my my email address out. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll do it here. I can yeah, do it get hard. spammed. So, and and <laughs> but make yes, sure, please. And make sure he has my phone number too. So okay. Yeah. That'll work Definitely. great. Excellent. 
and awesome. our our program only has only gone two hours and twenty five minutes. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so we're that's well pretty... under the three hours. Yeah. Hey, I was I was with uh, Sonny Conway uh, at his place in, in in Fresno, and we were on for like three and a half hours. I mean, I did oh most God. of the talking, and then he said, "Well, so and so." Uh, and I think it was Chad Smith was uh, mm -hmm. program was afterwards. So we immediately got on his program. I talked nonstop for oh almost God. six hours and I, I, I had almost no voice left. I mean, it was just nothing but gravel. Yeah. So I can't imagine but why. the audience is so grateful. We, we need more Jim. We need more Jim. So there's, the more there's, you talk, there's, the there's a number, there's a number of people would, would dispute that claim. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Yeah, but you're not married. You're not married to her anymore. <laughs> no, I'm married to a real sweetie who lets me go on road trips with my Corvette, and she doesn't yeah. even bat awesome. an eye. That's so, the way to live, buddy. Well, you got a she, good one there. She's 100 German, so I call her my Nazi bitch. And uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> with love, wow. with love, with you love. went right else. there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and I and I have two. I have two brown-eyed Nazis in our house. I have my wife. <laughs> And I have dog. I have Scarlett, who's my German Shepherd. Who is I was so glad that that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not the chef. No, no. it's not yeah. the chef. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Oh goodness. It's been a blast. Thank you it, guys so much. Yeah, my, I, I I had a, a and Lynn. I as usual, I had a, a very enjoyable uh, two and a half hours. Wonderful. And I look, yeah, I look, I look forward to Mondays now. Getting used to, but I do now. Aww. So Aww, that makes me so fun. happy. Yes. Yeah, they're and, fun uh, days now, not Mondays. Yeah, right. This is true. <laughs> this is true. All so. right. All right. All righty. Cool. Awesome. All right. Tim, this is adios. Us. Yeah. Aloha. Aloha. Hey, we, we lived in, yeah, he lived in Hawaii too. He knows all the places <laughs> I used to hang out at. I know all the lingo. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Take right care. On, bud. I all will right. talk to you guys later on. All right. All right. Um, signing off. Yeah. All right. Signing Thanks, off. guys. And thank yeah. you, Ciao. audience. All right. Good you night, everyone. <laughs> take care. All right. Night. You have you have a good one. And again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed your. I'm sorry. I missed your. Uh, you getting married. Oh no, that's okay. I think I snuck it in there with the cat. Like my cat died. Oh, by the way, I got married. But I really yeah. missed my yeah. cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. You no. Know. Thanks. Take care. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. All right. Good night, everyone. Hope you had a wonderful evening with us. Bye-bye.